Can I ask everyone to make sure the mobile phones are switched off, please, unless you have the permission of the board? Let's cook tries. Things happen, um, but, but, but as Alison will pretend you're robed for the time being. Yes, May it please the court. My yes, Lord, Mr. Curry. I appear for Mr. and Mrs. Majunda uh, in these appeals. Uh, my lords, um, just before the close of play yesterday, I did indicate that my submissions are likely to be between 15 to 20 minutes. I intend wholeheartedly to, to stick to that estimate, but I, of course, I beg the court's indulgence if I do stray slightly beyond that time estimate, and certainly wouldn't like my character or conduct to be called into question as well. Um, with that in mind, my Lord, uh, my Lord Lord Justice Underhead, at the outset of proceedings yesterday, uh, indicated that at least two of these appeals were academic. Uh, I think that was a reference in part to my appeal. Um, my skeleton argument does deal with this point, but I just wanted to, in very brief and bullet point form, uh, address the court as to why I say uh, our appeals are not academic subject to whether or not the court wants to hear me on that issue, as I said very briefly. Well, if it's brief, it's probably sensible to do. But we it is all in your skeleton argument, isn't it? It is, my lord. I just wanted to, as I said, in, in bullet point form... Right, right. Well, let's, have it, in, let's have it in bullet point form, yeah. My lord, it is correct, of course, that Mr Majumda has already had a first-year tribunal appeal. And, of course, he has won that appeal. And he essentially and do you have the FTT decision in, in the bundle? We do not, my lord, but I do have copies of it. If well, I think it would be useful to have it for completeness. Very well. Just while it's coming up, you can tell us what was it an appeal, what decision was it an appeal against? It was presumably a human rights appeal. It, it was a human rights appeal, my lord. Uh, 
um, it was against um, a 10-year long residence application made by Mr. Majumdar. And that appeal was allowed, as I've said. It was yes, I see. It's when one sees some of the... Perhaps you can help on this. One sees from the review that the cases fall into two groups, <coughs> ten-year um, cases where there is a statutory right of appeal, and five-year uh, cases where there isn't, unless it can be uh, characterised as a human rights uh, claim, an appeal against the refusal of a human rights claim. Indeed, uh, I hadn't, I'm afraid, fully taken on board that your case, at least, is a 10-year case, is it? The, well, the others the, are all five-year cases, aren't they? The, the, uh, the decisions which are the subject of these proceedings <coughs> were made under the five-year route. My client was one of those rare early birds who essentially put in his application well before his leave expired, and in the meantime, clocked up the 10 years. Yes, I see. Um, but the same doesn't apply to his wife, and that is why we say these proceedings are not academic. So, in other words, if the tribunal's determination stands, and of course it is the subject of an application by the Secretary of State at present, but if it were to stand, what would happen is Mr. Majumda would receive ILR, but his wife would be put on limited leave because she would simply be the dependent of a settled person. Whereas, if the underlying decisions in these proceedings are quashed and they are remade favorably, then Mrs. Majumda would have the significant benefit of obtaining ILR as well. And I emphasize that that is a significant she, benefit. Is she a party to this appeal? She is a party. Yeah. My Lord, I emphasize the importance of that because uh, if she doesn't have ILR, her status will be considered precarious within the terms of Section 117B. She would have to make a further application um, as and when necessary. And eventually, once she's clocked up the relevant period, she would have to, or she may qualify at that stage for ILR. So there is a material difference here in that she will be deprived of indefinite leave to remain. And of course, common sense tells us that that clearly uh, attracts far more benefits <coughs> than simply limited leave to remain. Furthermore, my Lord, um, there is a litigation debt as well as a result of the upper tribunal's adverse costs award in this case. And um, the consequence of that is that any future applications made by, not Mr. Majumda necessarily, but Mr. Majumda who is likely to have to make a future application if the, uh, the first year tribunal's determination stands, is that she will have to settle that litigation debt. Otherwise, she will fall for refusal under the general ground. And I can take the lordships to the relevant provision if necessary. Well, it's in the details in the study, aren't they? Um, it, it, it's not, my lord. But, um, uh, well, just give us, don't take us to them, but just give us the reference. Certainly. It, it is... Um, Paragraph 32013 of the immigration rules. It's one of the general grounds of refusal is that you owe, owe, owe the government money. If you, if you owe the government money, the government can refuse you on that basis. Yes, I and see. Of course, in principle, uh, the appellants, Mr. and Mrs. Majinda, say that the underlying decisions are vitiated by public law errors in this case, and the upper tribunal's decision also contains material er errors of law. So, as a matter of principle, why should they have to pay? A litigation debt of some four thousand plus pounds, in respect of decisions which, frankly, do not stand up to scrutiny in public yeah, or terms. Very well. Um, um, thank you. Uh, can I just ask one question about? I see the date of the FTT uh, decision. Um, the time for the Secretary of State to appeal has uh, expired. Has an appeal been? Has there been an attempt to appeal? The Secretary of State. Has initially appealed to the first year tribunal seeking permission to the upper yes. tribunal. That has been refused. However, they have now appealed directly to the upper tribunal. That is currently pending, awaiting yeah. a decision on Thank the Thank you. Okay. Uh, my Lord, finally on the academic point, of course, um, as your Lordships have observed from the outset, these are test cases, and of course it would assist the court in considering an well, array that, of... That point we've already made, yes. Uh, Thank you. My Lord, <coughs> with all of that out of the way, I can perhaps cut to the chase, as it were. Um, I begin by um, adopting the very comprehensive submissions of my learned friend, Mr. Biggs. Uh, and needless to say that he has covered much ground, and there is very little, if anything, for me to cover in addition to that. But there is one point that I seek to cover in respect of the Article 8 aspect, but I'll leave that to the end of my submissions. Uh, equally, I adopt the very helpful submissions of my, Mr., uh, of my uh, learned friend, Mr. Sami, 
particularly in terms of the tame site arguments. Now, um, the first document that I wish to take my lords to uh, is the review document, which appears in tab three, uh, tab 78, forgive me, of volume three of the authorities bundle. And it may be useful just to um, set out at the outset that I intend to work primarily from two bundles, volume three of the authorities bundle and volume two of the core bundle. So if those uh, could be to hand as it were, that may assist. Uh, that's helpful, thank you, yes. Behind tab 78, page 2247, 2247. Give me a moment. Give me, give me a moment. Yes. Uh, approximately halfway down the page. Sorry, which page did you say? 2247. Two, four, seven. Yes. There is a, a paragraph which begins, the most common issue that has resulted in the Home Office being in, unsuccessful in these cases has been the failure to distinguish between a late submission of tax and an amended tax return. Now, up till now, the court has essentially grappled with cases involving amendments, where a person makes X amount declaration initially to the HMRC, and at sub some subsequent point, amends that to, so that it is in line with what was declared to the Home Office. Those are not the facts which pertain to Mr. Majumda's appeal. And that's important because, as I said, there are an array of facts which present themselves in these cases. Miss, the complaint or allegation against Mr. Majumda essentially is that he was late in filing his tax return for one tax year. He was late by a year, but he had filed that tax return and paid his dues well over a year before he, the relevant ILR application. And as I said, that is an important distinction. And as the guidance recognizes, this is the area in which the Secretary of State has found the least success in these cases, because they have often conflated amendment cases with late submission cases. And that is precisely for the reasons that I will uh, attempt to uh, show the court what happened in the instant case. Yes. And with, with that in mind, my Lord, if I can then invite your Lordships to uh, consider the underlying decisions. I'm sorry, can you just help me with this? Um, without going to the decision method, um, Nevertheless, I, I, I'll put this down in some difference. Uh, but um, I, in the decision, did the um, Secretary of State effectively equate the failure to lodge the tax return on time uh, with dishonesty, as we've been told in the submission? Um, the Secretary of State equated, in effect, uh, an amendment of the tax return, the, the, the difference. Well, there is clearly reference to deceit and dishonesty in the decisions, and I'll take your lordship to that. Um, but um, what the Secretary of State, we say, did was to equate the late submission with, in fact, a retrospective amendment allegation, which is clearly factually incorrect. But, 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 but then led to dishonesty, you say. Yeah. Um, the underlying uh, decisions uh, appear in the core bundle, uh, second page 1425, and for present purposes, the relevant page is 1427. The Secretary of State sets out Rule 3225 and then refers to an earlier application made on the 21st of February 2013. That's the application in question. And then one paragraph below that. Uh, so sorry, wait, uh, did you say 1427? 
seven. Where does he set out one? Three, two, two. At, at the top of, of that page, in italic font. I've been stupid. He talked about three, two, two, one C. We look at the same page. Page one we forty. Are, we are, my lord. Yes. It says grounds on which leave to remain should normally be refused. Five. Oh, sorry. Uh, I can't say it's early in the morning. It's half past ten, but I haven't really um, warmed up yet. Yes. Thank you. And then below that, there's a reference to the 21st of February 2013 application. Yes. Which consisted of, um, I think, three separate types of income, uh, including self-employed earnings, which is the uh, earnings in question uh, for the sums st stated there, just over £12,000. In fact, just closer to £13,000. Uh, below that, the Secretary of State um, in the decision says that during your appointment at the Premium Centre, you were asked to com complete a questionnaire. Question 9 of this questionnaire states, are you satisfied that the self-assessment tax return submitted to HMRC accurately reflected your self-employed income? To which he answered yes. And of course they did. They were late, but they were accurate. But what we see in these decisions is a common theme. The Secretary of State relies on this to somehow suggest that answer was incorrect. The problem for the Secretary of State is that this question is very one-dimensional. It asks whether or not tax returns were accurate. It doesn't ask, were you late with your tax returns, which is a completely separate question. Just, just for my note, can, can you remind me of the date the tax return was submitted? It was submitted before the 19th of July 2016. Yes, my lord. It was submitted in March of 2015. And the tax is paid the following month, April of 2015. So as I said, well over a year before the ILR application. Uh, so the reference to the questionnaire is of little help in the context of this case because this isn't an amendment case where uh, one can question whether tax returns were accurate. Um, and then, uh, further, further down in that decision, um, it says that um, were it accepted that the figures declared in home, home Office were an accurate representation of your self-employed <coughs> earnings between those dates, your actions in failing to declare your earnings in full to HMRC would lead your application to be refused. That paragraph doesn't make much sense to me, but uh, what, what I gather from it is there's an allegation that there hasn't been full disclosure to HMRC, which again is factually incorrect because it declared to HMRC, albeit slightly late as it were. We then have a paragraph which begins, the Secretary of State considers that it would be undesirable for you to remain. And this is where we see the words deceitful and dishonest in your dealings with HMRC and or UK visas and immigration by failing to declare your claimed self-employed earnings to HMRC at the time. Now, again, that phrase is very ambiguous. What does at the time mean? In my submission, it could mean one of two things. It could either mean at the time of the application made to the Home Office back in February 2013, or it could mean at the time of the current application made for ILR in July 2016. Now, if we work on the basis of the former, i.e. at the time of the earlier application, of course, February 2013 uh, falls within a tax year. The tax year for that year would have ended in April 2013. Tax is not due until January 2014. So to suggest that in February when you made the application, you hadn't declared those earnings in February 2013, again, is a complete misapprehension of how the tax system works because the taxes were not due until another eight or nine months later, as it were. <coughs> if it's a reference to the instant application of July 2016, by then my client was home and dry. He paid his taxes well over a year before that date. So again, this um, contradictory language or unclear language doesn't assist, and this is something common not only in this case, but your lordships may appreciate in other cases as well. Then we have um, this interesting blanket approach, which I think uh, my lords dealt with or certainly uh, engaged with at uh, uh, some. Uh, length yesterday, which is on the one hand to say, well, you've either been dishonest with HMRC in under declaring your income and therefore avoiding tax or evading tax, or you have been dishonest with us by inflating your income and not uh, actually earning that sum. The problem with that double edged approach, my lord, is in respect of the latter, i.e. the allegation that you've inflated income to the UKBI or the UKBA as they were known previously, 
The problem with that logic, my lord, is that your lordships will know from various authorities that the points-based system is a very prescriptive system. It has very onerous evidential requirements. Typically, with these applications, one has to put in bank statements, invoices, etc. Now, at the point that the application is considered, the decision maker would have to assess whether that income is genuine, and based on the information presented, would ordinarily grant that application. To then turn around and say, well, actually, despite us having done that, we now believe that you've lied to us, well, it calls into question the clear, consistent, precise nature of the points-based system, which the Secretary of State uh, waves the flag in respect of in all of these appeals. Because if it is so clear, predictable, consistent, uh, in, and prescriptive in terms of the evidential requirements, how could something like this happen? And therefore, logically and rationally, the only remaining allegation that could stand to any proper scrutiny is that, in fact, you've underinflated, uh, underdeclared your income to HMRC. That simply doesn't apply in my client's case. He, didn't, he, he declared late, but he didn't underdeclare. He declared the correct amount late in the day. And that's, I just had a, had a quick look at the um, FTT decision. That is at least part of the basis on which the um, FTT decided to get the taxes. I know it's, it's the most significant part. Uh, because other than that, all the other aspects were met. Um, with that in mind, um, I, I can very quickly turn to the administrative review decision. Yeah. Uh, that appears, my lords, at page 1459. And if the um, original decision was concerning, I'm afraid it doesn't get any better. Because in the administrative review decision, page 1459, and in the final, forgive me, the penultimate paragraph, the Secretary of State, three lines from the bottom of the penultimate <coughs> paragraph, says this. However, the fact that you may have retrospectively amended your earnings is not su sufficient to satisfy the Secretary of State that you have not previously been deceitful or dishonest. The problem is, of course, there was no retrospective amendment. There was a belated tax return. So sorry, is. I was just making a note. Where, where, uh, I see, that's the... Penultimate yeah, no, but Yes, however, the fact you may... Yes. Yes. And then over the page, page 1460... Again, there is reference, middle of the page, paragraph which begins, you claim in your administrative review, there is reference to the questionnaire. And as I've indicated already, that questionnaire was of little use in the present context. Um, and then, um, further paragraph down, paragraph beginning further in your administrative review, you've cited AA Nigeria, one of the authorities, uh, my Lord Lord Justice Underhill, yeah. indicated maybe of some relevance. Um, that paragraph concludes by saying that paragraph 3225 is appropriate due to your conduct in declaring inconsistent earnings. What is the inconsistent earnings? I ask rhetorically. Um, and then, uh, to put the nail into the coffin, as it were, um, it, it, it simply says, well, um, we requested an explanation through the questionnaire. The explanation that was sought was, have you filed accurate tax returns? Nothing about, have you ever been late? Why have you been late? And of course, in this respect, it may be useful just to The question now, perhaps, is a point more for um, the Secretary of State's Council than for you, but at the moment, I don't quite see what the question has got to do with any of these cases, uh, yours for this particular reason, but more generally. Um, I think, I think uh, you, when you've put in mistaken tax returns, um, uh, there's a question whether you've done so deliberately or deliberately or innocently. The fact that at some later stage in the process you say that they're, um, uh, you believe they're correct, really just exactly the same questions arise. Unless some attention, something's been drawn to your attention that leads you to suppose that they were, or that suggests they were wrong in the first place. The questionnaire, 
merely draws out what's implicit in you putting in in the first place. Well, there are a range of cases in this cohort where individuals amend their tax returns well before they make or before they make the ILR application. Now, in those types of cases, perhaps that question may have some relevance because the question asks in plural terms, have you submitted accurate tax returns? Now, you may say, well, actually, no, one of them was inaccurate, but because of mistakes made by my accountants. Now, so one could see the utility of a question like that in that given context. Well, I mean, in a very un yeah, but normally you'll either have corrected them or you won't. If you haven't corrected them, you still think they're accurate. And if you have, uh, then obviously you answer in relation to the corrected return. Precisely, so, as I said, my lord, that, that question may have relevance simply to that very confined okay, well, situation. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it doesn't arise in my appeal, and therefore no. I need not trouble the court. But um, the point about the questionnaire is that, yes, my client, it is important to bear in mind that these are serious allegations, and the nature and the basis of the allegations must be clearly communicated. It may be suggested, well, the questionnaire puts you on notice. Now, accepted my client is a highly skilled migrant, but my lord, he isn't a clairvoyant. How could anyone from that questionnaire ascertain or determine that the Secretary of State wants to know that whether I've been late with my tax return on one or other occasion? That simply, um, th th that question simply does not fulfill that purpose of putting you on notice as to what the very serious and precise allegation is. And as we've seen from the decision in my case, the allegations are very imprecise, they're very unspecific, they're very generalized. And in fact, th that probably runs across the board. The double-edged approach, you either like to ask or like to the home office, that kind of stuff. There is a lack of specificity which is required given the serious nature of the allegations, the draconian consequences that follow and so forth. Um, there is... Um, just a couple of authorities I want to take my lords to. One of those is the upper tribunal's uh, decision of the then president in Anjo, which appears behind tab 82, volume 3 of the authority. Volume 2. Oh, no, 80, 82. 82, volume yes. yep. no, Thank you. Um, and I don't want to dwell on this authority for any particular length of time. I just invite the, the court to have regard to the second judicial head note. I see in it that um, you seem to have got silk at that point. M my lord, that wasn't myself. I think that was someone else. <laughs> yes, so where are we going? The second judicial head note, which reads, uh, an immigration interview may be unfair. Of course, that is in the context of an interview. My client's case uh, is less fortunate in the sense that he wasn't even interviewed. And of course, we've seen in some of these cases where there are interviews taking place. Again, returning to the dicta, predictable, fair, consistent immigration policy doesn't seem very fair and consistent in my case. Um, but what it says, uh, in a nutshell, trite proposition, is that there can't be a rigid application of questions. There has to be some spontaneity. Uh, and precisely what we see with these questionnaires is the rigid application of questions and the lack of spontaneity needed to uh, have regard to the nuances of each individual case. After all, these have to be fact sensitive assessments, and I think there's no controversy in respect of that. Um, but, it, but in your case, you, you say that the questionnaire was responded to uh, correctly. Precisely. Yes. So there's, there's no sort of ambiguity. You said there's no ambiguity. There was a question, you answered it correctly, Absolutely. and that. As far as the questionnaire is concerned, that's that. Uh, absolutely. But the Secretary says re repeated reliance on that in their decisions suggests that somehow they've got the wrong end of the stick, as it were, for want of a better phrase. Um, there is one other authority, my lord. It's the decision of the upper tribunal in Williams behind tab 73, volume 3 of the authorities. And paragraphs 23. to 34 are of relevance. I, I, I don't um, expect the court to read all of that immediately, but perhaps paragraph 24 and 26 will suffice for present purposes.
the point is, Williams was a case similar to my case in that that was a, a late submission case, and the upper tribunal recognised that, in fact, these cases are different. And that appears to have been echoed in the Secular States Review Guidance, which I took to Lordships to at yeah. the outset of my submission. Um, so this is a classic case of the Secular State looking at my case through the wrong end of the telescope, i.e. <coughs> conflating my case with an amendment case, which it wasn't. Um, finally, in terms of the facts of my client's case, um, one just, of the... Just one, just one moment. Um, yes, I see. Yep, and um, indeed the case of Williams is one where the Secretary of State, which is set out in detail, um, uh, sorry, refers to in detail in the review. Yes, and in fact interviewed Mr. Williams, as I understand. Um, one final point um, on the facts of my case. Um, it is suggested in the decisions that there would be a clear benefit to my client in evading tax, as it were. Now, it's important to have regard to the common sense element of such a rationale or c conclusion. My client, at the high watermark of, of the Secretary of State's case is that uh, he was late or whatever in respect of a tax declaration for self-employment in the sum of £12,900. The tax due on that was £3,000. Now let's put that in context. The ILR application he made was 5000 plus. Now to suggest that somehow my client would be willing to forego and give up and risk his settlement, his livelihood, his private and family life with his wife for the sake of £3,000 seems rather far-fetched. And in my respectful submission, that is a relevant consideration which has been wholly overlooked by the Secretary of State in considering whether there was dishonesty or deceit and in considering the desirability or otherwise of my client's presence in the United Kingdom. And of course, as I said, these are intrinsically fact-sensitive cases, but that has to be a salient feature in my submission. Um, my Lords, those are the submissions I wish to make in terms of the facts of my case. I did say at the outset that there was one additional point which I wish to um, uh, add on to, which uh, I think my learned friend Mr. Biggs uh, simply didn't have for time reasons to cover. Uh, in, this is in respect of Article 8. My Lords, Lord Justice Underhill and Lord Justice Singh, um, of course, are aware of the judgment of this court in Asif Khan. This is the judgment which followed the Arsal case, where the Secretary of State... I'm sure, I'm not sure I'm aware of it, but anyway. My Lord, yes, I can take your Lordship to the... Um, to the authority. It was it referred is, to yesterday, but we weren't taken to it. It is uh, volume two of the authority. Tab 36. I'm sorry, which tab? Tab 36. <coughs> Clearly, I should be aware of it, but... Um, you, you, you were at the time. <laughs> I was at the time. Uh, my Lord kindly says... Yes. Uh, my Lord, just to briefly recap, and I, I mean no discourtesy to the court, of course, but the court no doubt sits in many cases and... No, no, well, as, as we've just demonstrated, I need the recap, uh, even if... Um, these were cases Lord which followed on from the Assan line of litigation, where the Secretary of State... And in respect of curtailment and refusal decisions, I stress curtailment and refusal, not refusals of settlement like the instant case, but in curtailment decisions and refusal decisions, accepted that perhaps the most pragmatic and the correct approach would be for there to be some type of human rights consideration, which will then yield an appeal to the first year tribunal, through which will be the correct forum for findings of fact to be made as to the allegation of deception. In those cases, ETS deception. In the instant cases, we have allegations of decep deception as well, but we have it in a more stark scenario, i.e. the refusal of settlement. So I say it's a fortiori, and it's unclear why the Secretary of State has taken one stance in those proceedings, but appears to take a wholly inconsistent stance in respect of these proceedings, when the common thread is the allegation of deception, albeit in the current context, we have far more draconian consequences and we have the hostile environment that we have to navigate as well. Uh, for those reasons, my Lord, I submit uh, that our appeal, appeals of SM and his wife, should be allowed, and a relief has sought in the skeleton to be found. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Perry.
Now, Mr. Slatter, um, I'm sorry, as I mentioned yesterday, you won't be appear on the live stream, which I think is in principle desirable, if, unless you, unless everyone moves up. I think you're now in view. Can't actually see, but yes, I think you are. Yes. Um, so I have uh, um, essentially three grounds of appeal before, before the court. Um, I intend to say um, four things um, in relation to the first ground. In fact, um, I think so you're, not, you're not in view. Well, we, we can't see it. There's a time delay anyway. Uh, but I think you will be in view if you stand in front of... Um, if you stand where Mr. Kareem was. That's it. Thank you. Sorry about that. F f five points, did you say? Uh, four points in relation to the, the first ground. And the second of those, I think, covers the third ground. And a couple I'm of sorry, I haven't got all your grounds in mind. But, um, um, so there are three grounds. One of it's the, the Wellesbury um, that the judge heard in, in not... Um, his decision on Wednesday principles. Yes. Um, the second is procedural unfairness. Uh, and the third um, sort of the overlap between those two is in relation to the um, uh, verification of earnings in paragraph 19. Well, in any event, let, yes, let, 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 let's hear what your points are. We'll see where they fit in. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, so the, 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 the first point is, is that the, um, uh, the previous earnings for the period December 11 to December 12 were clearly proven. Um, and uh, the, the, it's, it's important, I think, to appreciate, it, which the judge doesn't, um, that the extent to which the specified evidence was required. It wasn't simply um, uh, making a self-declaration that um, the Secretary of State took on trust. It had to be proven on the balance of probabilities with very prescribed documents um, which were su submitted. And it's, it's tab 12, page 239, which is um, the paragraph 19 of Appendix A. Um, at the relevant time, which sets out. I'm, I'm sorry, I think you're being, I absolutely um, commend going straight into the heart of the matter, mm. but, and I'm sure my lords are both entirely up with your points, but I'm a bit slower. Um, just go back. W what exactly is the point, the point you're making and before you give all these references? Right, so, so, so the, the four points in relation to the, the Wednesbury uh, review is, is essentially, first of all, um, these um, previous earnings claims right. relied Which, upon in the January 13 application. Well, you see, which is the... Gen I haven't got the facts that there are four cases here. I haven't got the facts of all the cases immediately in mind. I know they'll be in the skeleton, mm -hmm. but... Uh, just remind me of the basic facts. Your client made an application. So my client made a, he came in 2007, and he, he made three um, applications, first as a student, and he extended it as a post-study um, worker, and then uh, he, he, he entered the um, uh, uh, Tier 1 general route in, in 2010, I believe. And then he made subsequent applications to, uh, for further leave to remain in that category. Um, one of which was on the 17th of January 2013. And that's the one in respect of which he said to her, uh, in respect to which his, his uh, figures are said to have been right. Yes. Okay, so January 2013, figures inaccurate, right. And then he applies for indefinite leave surrender after five continuous years on the 3rd of February 2016. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the gravamen really of, of certainly the upper tribunal's decision is. Is, is in relation, I mean, that the Secretary of State classically sat on the fence and said, um, we're not sure, um, well, he says inconsistently in the refusal, we think you lied to both us and HMRC, or, but also or either one. or, yes, right. um, and, and also refuses um, to accept that the current earnings in the application in 2006. I, I don't, we don't need to be taken to the detail, but just give me the reference for the decision letter. So it's effectively in the same form as the ones we have seen uh, in the same Mr. Yeah, Balajigari's case. Discrepancy um, uh, and and uh, and 
therefore dishonesty. There is the motive, I think, Your Lordship. Well, hang on one second, because I seem to remember, and indeed I've marked it up when I looked at it beforehand, that this is the one where they refer both to 3222 and 3225. Yes. Yes, um, I see. Okay. So, um, Secretary of State decision um, 609 rely, relies, uh, as it were, re relies on uh, uh, lying to HMRC or um, Home Office or both. Yeah? Yeah. And also, I think that the way in, and I'll come to it in a, in a moment, but it was, I think, um, under paragraph 19 of Appendix A, which is, an, is a, a genuine earnings test, it's a subjective yes. assessment of, of whether or not, even though you meet the prescribed requirements in terms of the specified documents, the Secretary of State yes. inserted it into the rules, paragraph 19, I, J, and K, in October 2013, which then allowed the Secretary of State to take account I think, nine or ten factors in assessing whether or not the, the earnings relied upon in the application for the period of 12 months immediately preceding it were genuine earnings. And one of those factors, uh, Roman numeral four, uh, was to uh, ask whether or not those previous earnings could be verified, and that included uh, asking whether or not previous earnings claims um, in previous applications could be verified. Yes. So I think that's quite an important provision that then um, it is a route into the general grounds of 3222 and 3225. Yes. Um, I did actually um, uh, see that the, the, um, the background to the insertion of those particular provisions, genuine earnings test in the rules wasn't before your lordships in the bundles, so took the liberty of, of copying, making copies of, of the statement of changes in, in the rules. Um, do you want us to see those? I'll ask you an hand yes, up. please do. Um, you get to that now. <coughs> Thank you. So this is the in, in, in introduction of. And just to give us the um, the paragraph in the statement of changes. So it's paragraph one hundred and fifty. Uh, I've sidelined the, the, the relevant parts. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and I've, I've uh, and you can see from page four of that bundle that uh, it applied to applications decided on or after the 1st of October 2013. Um, so you have in the bundle of authorities at tab uh, 12 the. Um, well, we. The, 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 the previous, the, the, the word, the rules. In, in paragraph 19 preceding that, uh, those statement changes, then in tab 13 you have the, 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 the rules after yes. that. Well, um, that's helpful, thank you. That's, but it's my fault, you were, you were plunging straight into your points. I slowed you up just to get my bearings. Um, uh, so, so if, if that, can we if, come back to the actual points you want to make? Yeah, so, so it, essentially um, the, the three main points are um, it, it, I ought to have uh, found on, on Wednesday principles that given the fact that the, the applicant had, had already proven, clearly proven, is, is the wording of paragraph 19, subparagraph C uh, of, of Appendix A, it is earnings by reference to specified documents. And in the judicial review skeleton argument, paragraph 21, which is on page 634, the fund I set out in detail uh, how those um, uh, uh, how points were, were acquired. Relation to those specified documents that, that were submitted, yep. um, uh, that, uh, that, that those earnings had been the probability of the balance of prob probability. Secondly, those previous earnings had been verified. Uh, and this is um, an important point that's, I think, in this, my parents uh, appeal uh, has created sort of uh, some confusion. Um, but it is an important point because he turns up with his application on the 3rd of, of February. 2016, with the tax calculation document, the SA302, issued by the HMRC on the 17th of December 2015, um, and submits that, and then he's interviewed, and essentially he's asked a series of interviews as to why HMRC records that the Home Office have are different from this uh, tax calculation document that he's submitting. Um, 
But before going into, into the, the specific points in his case, it's perhaps worth mentioning um, a couple of general points that um, in relation to the, the wording of paragraph 19J4. So j j just on a previous point, it, 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 is your point that the, um, the, the higher earnings, that, that, let us call them, uh, w were verified in the 2013 immigration application? Yeah, that was successful. It was granted. No, I know, I know it was successful. Mm. So that was, but that, in that application, the higher earnings were relied upon unverified. No, they weren't verified at that time. And, and, and that's the, the difficulty is that when you make the application, you're relying on a period of earnings for the previous 12 months that you wouldn't have, the, 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 um, the date for submission of your tax return wouldn't have fallen in June at, at that time. We have a tax return at the moment. In terms, I just want to know what your point is in relation to this um, uh, verification of these earnings in 2011-2012. Yes, yeah, so, so we said by the date his ILR application, those have been verified. But, but but what's your point, Mr. Yeah. Slatter? Well, is your point that once they've been verified, they, 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 they can't be gone back on by the Home Office? No, 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 so, so the, point, the point is that the, the sole basis of reliance on the refusal of the current... Uh, Earnings was that they're not genuine because yeah. because of the discrepancy yeah. uh, because of verification issue that arose in your previous earnings, uh, and that, that issue did, didn't arise because those earnings had been verified yeah, in this but, case. But when and by whom? By HMRC when he made the amended tax return, which was consistent with his previous earnings relied on in the 2013 application, then uh, the, those previous earnings that had been relied upon were verified by HMRC. But, but, but so what? Does that, what's your point? I mean, honestly, they were verified by HMRC, so, so, so why does that make the decision by the Home Office, which is what we're challenging now, unlawful? Okay. Spell it out. Um, Are you saying that it is unlawful of the Secretary of State to go behind verification by HMRC? I mean, is that your point? Uh, yes, I mean... The, 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 the reason why it was refused is because it was said that there was an issue in terms of verification, and there wasn't an issue because the, those previous earnings had been verified. Perhaps if I take you to, to the, the relevant um, authorities. No, I think take us to the decision first. Sorry, it was Show, show us where it is said. So 609 of the bundle. Yes. <coughs> um, you can see it sets out paragraph 19J of Appendix A in his reference to Roman numeral 4. Verifications of previous earnings claims with declarations made in respect of the applicant to other departments. Of yeah. course, the, the, the current earnings relied on in the ILR application couldn't be verified because the tax return hadn't been submitted. It also included declarations made in respect of earnings claimed by the applicant in previous applications. Yes, now let's just see what let's just see the reasons. So the reasons are uh, and this we're looking at six six hundred and ten. Six hundred and ten. It's in three places the Secretary of State refers to HMRC records as showing um, uh, Show us the passages. Figures. Show us the passages. So unfortunately it's not numbered. In the middle you can see just below the middle, however HMRC records show. And then the third paragraph from the bottom on the, the last sentence, however, according to HMRC records, you only declared. And the last paragraph, as the HMRC records show considerable discrepancy. So despite the Secretary of State having um, a, an FSA 302 issued by HMRC and actually acknowledging that the... Um, that the uh, tax return for that period had been amended, 2012-13, the Secretary of State continued to refer to unamended HMRC records. Uh, and that begs the but question... Is, aren't, aren't they right? Their point is that before amendment, you were dishonest. Yeah, well, well they, they, they seek to have it both ways. They're saying before, before amendment... Um, you were dishonest to either to HMRC or to UKBI, but they don't pin their, 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 their colours to the mask and say, say which. Um, 
But the point is that the, the, there is um, what, what, what the, cons the, the, the concern is that the process for verification isn't transparent, uh, and we, we don't know exactly how the Secretary of State verifies um, previous earnings claims. Um, and uh, 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 the, the um, uh, in relation to my, my the appellant uh, Kawas's appeal, what he says in the administrative review application at paragraph eight which is page 852, I went off to, to turn that up, uh, is that he was told by HMRC that they couldn't update his record online following his amendment made in October 2015. Um, so he's then issued uh, a letter of the third, at the same date of the interview saying we're going to make further inquiries. Um, the refusal letter doesn't, whilst it acknowledges the amendment, it still persists in referring to the unamended figures. Um, and we know from the letter at page 745 from HMRC that no further inquiry was made by the Home Office in, in their case. Um, uh, and it's not until the, the, uh, the, the defendant's detailed grounds of defence that it said for the first time it, that the verification of the previous earnings is not, not in dispute. Um, so it was erroneous for the judge to rely upon the, the ground of refusal on paragraph 19J4 because the verification of those previous earnings was, was not in dispute at the date of the decision. And it was not alleged that the document that he's submitting uh, on the 3rd of February 2016 is a, is a false document. There's no reliance on 3221A. Um, uh, but the, 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 the point is that the, his previous earnings that he'd already proven had been verified were verified by HMRC because the amended tax return was consistent, uh, the figures were consistent with what he previously declared in his 2013 application. So given that, that that was the only issue under paragraph 19, because it was only uh, that one, the Roman numeral 4 that was relied upon, um, was unsustainable to, 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 to uh, <coughs> uphold the Secretary of refusal on that basis. That was ground four in the judicial review grounds. It's now ground three uh, before the court. Uh, but essentially, there was no evidential basis um, to refuse on the 3222, because both, not only had he proven his previous earnings, but those of previous earnings were also verified uh, at the date of, of the decision. And, and it's clear, I think, from, from the uh, tribunal's decision in paragraph 58 and 59, uh, that the gravamen of, of, of her decision was that, that you lied in your previous application to the Home Office, and therefore the Secretary of State was entitled to also rely upon 3225 uh, of the general grounds for refusal. <coughs> My Lord, did you, are, you, are you with me on, on, on those points in relation to the 3222 issue? Thank you. Uh, 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 the third point... Um, it is that not only were they, they, they proven and verified, but also tax, relevant tax, was paid on those previous earnings. <clears throat> and this was one of the motives given by the Secretary of State for, for saying that he, he, he lied to the um, H, uh, HMRC um, in order to decrease his, his tax liability. Uh, and it was also relied upon by the respondent both in the detailed grounds of defence and also the respondent's skeleton argument, um, uh, incorrectly, because the appellant had no additional tax liability um, as a result of that amended tax return. And that was because he was, his earnings that he was relied upon were dividend uh, income, which he paid corporation tax upon, uh, and as a result of falling within the base, <coughs> basic rate tax burden. Um, didn't have any additional tax to pay. Um, and that was important. That was something the Secretary of State ought to have known, um, ought to have, um, I think, following the, the, the case of DK at, at tab 59, and the Wensbury reasonable basis, ought to have made sure she was appraised of all the relevant facts. Uh, and certainly it was open under the verification system to check whether uh, the accounts um, which declared his full dividend income had been filed with Company's House, uh, and whether or not there was, in fact, any um, less tax paid uh, as a result of his amendment to, to his tax return.
Um, and I don't think it, it, it's obviously worth um, just referring you to the case of Khan, just Justice Spencer's decision in, in Khan, which is um, the, sort of the, the leading uh, authority for these cases at, at, at present. Um, and that uh, says so tab 65. Volume three, I promise you. We have looked at this already. What, if, what, what's the particular point you want to Yeah, well, well, well I think there are a couple of points, and I'd obviously adopt my what uh, Mr. Biggs says about the problems of that case. Um, uh, but just to uh, agree that I think the, the starting point um, uh, was, is wrong um, and seems to be a reversal of the burden of proof, as my, my Lord, Mr. Justice Singh pointed out yesterday, and also doesn't sit easily, if at all, with the fourth criticism of the Secretary of State's decision um, on page uh, uh, 1,870 of the bundle, towards the, the bottom uh, of that page, where he talks about the, criticising the Secretary of State's reversal of the burden of proof in that sentence. Uh, and it also doesn't um, sit easily with, with the, the main... Uh, rationale uh, of the case, which appears uh, again on the, on the uh, same page um, in terms of the, the second uh, criticism, um, uh, which is consistent with the, the, the outer session of Scottish cases as well, um, is that there's uh, obviously an important difference between carelessness and, and dishonesty, and simply a, a, a significant discrepancy isn't in itself um, sufficient. Well, these, these are very much the points we've already had. I think what we're really interested in is points peculiar to your client's case. Could, 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 I, could I just, uh, I know you've been taken to the Home Office for review as well. Um, there are there some, points in it peculiar, Mr Slatter, are there points in it peculiar to your client's there, case? There are, because there's, there's, there's right. reference uh, specifically at 2238 um, to uh, case workers being asked to consider whether or not earnings may have taken the form of dividends from the applicant's business rather than the salary. Uh, and that, that's 2238, um, to consider whether there are other explanations um, for uh, the difference. Um, uh, but the, 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 the essential reasoning, I think, in Khan by Mr. Justice Spencer at paragraph 33 and 34 it is, is in relation to imputing dishonesty by reference to um, an unexpected lack of liability to pay tax as he refers to the, the applicant, would have known his or her earnings and would have expected to pay tax uh, upon them. And also that in, in, over the page that it would normally be the case that an applicant would soon become aware of the error because of his unexpected lack of liability to pay tax. That, 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 those don't, that, that reasoning doesn't hold any purchase in, in my client's case because there wasn't um, any further uh, lack of uh, tax liability. Uh, so the Potential criticism of the refusal letter in this case is very similar to the Khan uh, case uh, and also the Scottish cases uh, that the Secretary of State hasn't addressed the mind properly to the difference between carelessness or inadvertent um, uh, mistake falling short of dishonesty and dishonesty itself. Um, How are we doing with your points, Mr. Slato? We haven't. We, 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 we. So that, 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 that's the last. Uh, so, so that the, the fact that you paid tax. Um, on, on it as a result of the, the, the dividends, um, uh, it m meant that there was no evidential basis to support the contention that the initial uh, tax return was correct, nor any basis to support the, the contention that the, the previous earnings claims were incorrect. Um, the last of the, the four points in relation to the Wem Wemsbury, uh, I'll be brief on, on these, um, is that the upper tribunal's direction, paragraphs 45 and 46, um, which you'll find at 558 to 559, doesn't provide any confidence that the judge recognised the highly calibrated nature of the review in light of the context at hand. There's no mention of paragraph 32 of Geary. There's no acknowledgement of the non-uniform application of Wensbury 
the view following Kennedy. Um, and there's no reference to the standard of proof required. And you know the standard of proof is important from Kahn at paragraph 35 and also head note 3 in tab 65. Um, these were points that were actually pleaded in the ground for judicial review at 1.1. Um, and it's, it's, it's the, what, what we say, the fact that Secretary of State was sitting on the fence um, belied the, the, the fact that she, it was simply a suspicion and there wasn't sufficient evidence. But it wasn't permissible uh, for the judge to also sit on the fence. It either had to be, one of them had to be correct, either the initial filing of the tax return or um, the, the initial of the previous earnings. They couldn't both be correct, of course. Um, but the judge but there's nothing the wrong in there's nothing wrong in the Secretary of State saying I can't tell which of your inconsistent things was dishonest, but I am satisfied that one of them was. That can't be wrong in principle, can it? My Lord, uh, I think it can. I mean, I, I think the Secretary of State needs to um, pin her uh, the colours to the mask. It's inconsistent with with the, with the Home Office review, which indicates that it was three two two. I mean, it's the rationales that an appeal was allowed on the basis that the judge couldn't decide whether it's one or the other. And then the Home Office said, well, we've got to shift from 3222 refusal to 3225. It perhaps would make so much difference if, if, if the, an applicant was, wasn't then subjected to a hostile environment and uh, forced to become a, a, a victim of that environment before holding the Secretary of State to account and asking for the, the, the finding to be... Decided. In, look, Mr. Sattar, I must be frank with you. We, we've got a very limited amount of time. Um, we still got to hear from the Secretary of State. Um, some of your submissions have indeed been very specific to your case. But I, I, if you can just identify now, so I know wh where you're going, what remaining points you have to make, so I can be sure they are specific to your case, and, and give me some sort of estimate of how long they're likely to be. So I just have a couple of points on procedural unfairness. Very well, let's hear those. <clears throat> um, first of all, I think it's right to say that the interview record itself isn't relied upon by the respondent in his decisions in these cases. Um, uh, uh, but it is um, by, by the upper tribunal judge. Um, but the, the two points are essentially um, that the Secretary of State doesn't disclose the case uh, that the uh, appellant needed to meet in this case. And secondly, didn't give them a fair opportunity um, to respond to it. Do we have the interview record? Yes. Where, where, where is it? Given two different, two different. Um, Other pages as well. I don't mind which. Let's look at the same one. Is it? Uh, well, I've got the eight six, six seven. seven. Uh, anyway, I think I can make three points about the. the well, let's just. Ready to disclose the case when. Yes. Rely upon obviously the authorities and then from Mr. Biggs point out Osborne, Fay, and okay. Cottle. Um, so uh, what? Essentially, the, 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 the what, what's put to the application? Is, the applicant is why Home Office record, HMRC records that they refer to, which is the unamended. Wh which page records. of the record is this? <coughs> so it's um, 681 of the bundle. Um, I'm looking at. Uh, which which question? Question five. Very short interview, but essentially says our records show that you declared to HMRC official. Sorry, I haven't got that yet. Question five. Our records. For, yes, right. He's, he's asked to explain. Um, you, you're, uh, yet you have produced an SA 302, the tax year 2013, showing a figure of 29,555. Can you explain the discrepancy? Yes. So he's asked to explain why the records are different. He yep. says initially that was the amount. Later we discovered it was wrong. I mean, we read the accounting. Um, the same week in October, you filed the amendments. Uh, and uh, made that. so he's, he's, he's answering the question of why there's a discrepancy within the record. He's then asked, so when did you realise this mistake, October 2015? Then he's asked a very vague question, how did it come about? Um, and he, what, what he, his answer is how, how he realised 
Uh, it, it came about whilst before preparing the application, sifting through the documents in the 2013. Those answers, we say, were, were apt to the questions he was asked. Um, he wasn't given any impression that his answers weren't satisfactory. Um, and, and, it, and they clearly followed the line of questioning. Um, and, and then, so when he was told in the decision letter, effectively the reversal of, of the burden uh, of that you haven't established, we're not satisfied that there, there was not, not a genuine error, not by reference to his questions. He then seeks on the administrative review application to submit a letter from his accountant, which the Secretary of State then refuses to admit on the administrative review application, despite it being permissible to rely upon it, because he meets AR 2.4a and b because it's a reference to show a case-working error in relation to the general ground of refusal under 3222. Um, and it was, it was <coughs> adduced in response to the allegation uh, that the, it wasn't a genuine error in his tax return in order to show it was a genuine amendment and also to show there was no uh, extra tax liability. And it was clearly wrong for the respondent to refuse it. Um, this was the third ground for judicial review that I've now assumed in the second round for uh, subsumed in the second round for the court. Um, and, and what ought to have happened, as I say, um, following uh, what's said in paragraph 32 and 34 by Khan, is that um, it's accepted, rejects Mr. Malik's fifth proposition, and accepts an accountant's explanation can be potentially significant. And when faced with that evidence, then there's a task for the Secretary of State to embark on a fact-finding investigation. Where is the accountant's because, explanation in the bundle? So the, the, the can actually prepare a, a witness statement on, on the judicial review, but his explanation, I think it was the 18th of... Uh, oh, I just I don't want the date, I want the, pa I want the page in the bundle. Page is um, 673. <coughs> Thank you. So this is the one that was sought to put in and they, and they didn't admit. Yes. Thank you. Administrative uh, review decision, which is at six um, six oh five. It says we will not consider the new evidence and it appears it misdirects yep. itself in law in that regard. That's all I have to say, my worship. So I apologise for. No, thank you. That's been uh, that's been helpful. Um, yes. Right. Um, <coughs> Uh, not going to hear from you now, Mr. Um, uh, we, uh, I think it would be most useful when we've heard the Secretary of State and have identified what seem to be the issues on which we can have most help and if there's still time. Um, my Lords, on that basis then, um, obviously I can't respond to something that hasn't been put. There's been a lot put in in terms of writing. And well, I think at the moment none of it is in. That, that's really what I want to... I think we will take stock at the end of your submissions. Uh, we will identify points in the intervention which are conceivably relevant to points that seem important. Uh, and uh, if we have time, we will um, hear Ms. Nate briefly on them. Uh, and uh, another possibility if we're very short of time and we'll simply have to say that we will take account of the things set in the, the written intervention on those points and you can then deal with them. Well, my Lord, that, that's exactly my point, my Lord. That it, it, I've got the point. It, it, it's yes, we've got, we've moment, got the point. If it comes in, I just want to establish that I do need an opportunity to um, consider uh, the we're, we're very aware of that. Okay. Um, the moment, point. it's the moment, although we have read parts of it, if any, I say we have undertaken not to rely on anything that is only there. But I've given you the opportunity to deal with it. Yeah. Thank you very much, my Lord. Because I could see that we were going to be short of time, um, I have um, taken the trouble to put down essentially what I'm going to say to say with note taking. Um, it well, should mean be very we can take Thank it quite you. quickly. Um, I obviously have to emphasise this was done very quickly overnight, and so it seems to be um, right with imperfections. Um, I've also um, given you a copy of, uh, well, actually, won't give you one. I've given you a copy of um, Lord Sumption's speech to Alba, um, which is interesting reading in itself, but it is relevant to um, anxious scrutiny and heightened scrutiny, which does come in in this case, um, given the Article 8 point as well. Um, I've got two new copies there. Well, I have taken, 
interrupt just that overnight I just prepared a bundle of authority with respect to factual scrutiny, which are the Supreme Court cases that follow. It's only about five. If the court wants them, I can hand over. Uh, I think I mentioned that to him. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, whether we need to look at them in the end, it's never any harm in having them. But let's um, get these Mr. Anderson's documents first. Um, well, if you're that if time is short, come to it when you come to it. Right. So, well, look, this is intended to be a response to the oral submissions that were made following the order of the oral submissions that were made um, by Mr. Biggs. Um, my learned friend, Mr. Malik, will be responding um, mainly to the submissions made by Mr. Saini and the other advocates on their fact specific matters. Yes, uh, Those submissions you. are probably going to take a little time, and so I am going to try to do this as quickly as possible. Should I become incoherent um, by um, taking it at too great a speed, please do say we, we will. St I think it's very important we get this right. We'll have to see where we are if we have problems on some of the individual cases, but um, uh, let's deal with the general points so as fully as we have to. Um, as a preliminary point, um, we're dealing with these appeals on the basis that the sort of procedural elements of what was raised below and whether it um, should be raised, etc., are being put to one side for these purposes. Um, what I ask is that if that's the approach that's being taken, it's carried through so that the upper tribunal isn't faulted for not considering something, as it were, or the Secretary of State for not um, considering something that's developed by way of argument now um, and has been considered more fully now. So the spectacles with which those decisions are reviewed, and that, of course, must be the main purpose of us being here. It is an appeal against upper tribunal um, decisions on judicial review um, that the approach is carried through. Yes, so the point is we may perhaps, at least in principle, say uh, the law is X, Y, and Z, but... Uh, that doesn't help one or more appellants in the particular cases because the case was never put that way. Um, yep. so Very well. Um, whether so we'll actually do that, we'll have to see. But in principle, yeah. it's open to us to do that. Yeah. I mean, I the court that. may wish to actually decide the procedural points and deal with this in that way. Or it may be, well, these are lead cases. Um, it's not exactly over to, but the guidance that's being given doesn't necessarily mean that they're unlawful in these particular cases, the decisions. I that that one, your first point. Thank you. So um, the three questions that were identified, or three areas that were identified at the beginning, I've given some very short bullet points on that, which are a sort of overview, so I'm not going to unpick them now. We'll come to them in um, uh, due course under the actual detailed submissions. But the sort of short answer to those three questions is, can decisions in principle be made under paragraph 3225 in this context? The answer to that is yes. Indeed, helpfully, it's been now um, uh, uh, conceded, if that's the right term, um, by the appellants that you know, this area of making um, uh, declarations um, that uh, have been found to be containing an element of dishonesty um, can, in principle, fall within 3225. It's not a provision that's limited um, by type of subject matter in the manner that's been um, argued previously below. But then, of course, the question is, uh, in these individual cases, uh, was the application correct? So it's also a common ground that, and this is important, my lords, that as a matter of assessment of public interest, um, it's not a balancing exercise of individual rights against collective rights in an Article 8 sense. Um, it's something different, that it is assessing the public interest in whether or not it's undesirable for um, a, a migrant to be given leave to remain. So um, which of your points is this? So this is little two, so under the headline okay. three. And because it's a matter of assessment, it doesn't involve the burden of proof. Um, my learned friend very helpfully, um, Mr. Biggs, indicated that in these areas of assessment, of reasonableness, of, of the sort of um, uh, consideration, inferences from evidence, that type of area, these are matters of judgment. And that's not one where 
Um, you use burden of proof because burden of proof is really um, I can't make up my mind about the answer on this case. Well, I'd, is it as simple as that? The ultimate test is desirability or undesirability. But if a particular fact is the basis of the finding of undesirability, um, that is, the Secretary of State has dropped a former view on that, yeah. uh, one way or the other. That is binary. Yes, that's accepted, my Lord. But if we're talking about primary evidence, so is the primary evidence cogent? Um, are they reliable documents? Is this material um, for making the primary findings of fact um, cogent? And of course that's accepted, and that's that, 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 that it needs to be cogent evidence. But that's different to saying that the Secretary of State has to prove that the person is dishonest um, on a particular standard of proof, as if it's a, a fact that can be sort of proved in the sense of... Um, so whilst I accept it's binary, I accept that um, there's going to ultimately be a finding of dishonesty or, or not dishonesty, there must be an element of judgment in there and assessment, as well as, of course, when we get to the um, stage of undesirability. So my basic submission is that really none of the private law concepts of burden of proof, evidential concepts, are really very helpful in getting to the bottom of what should be happening here. They're mainly more public law um, assessment and judgment. I'm afraid I'm not following this. No, I've got my thumb up. In, in terms of, in, I'm sorry, in terms of the assessment, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the assessment. Uh, but as my Lord said, um, the assessment may be based upon facts, past facts, not future risk, past facts. Um, here, uh, the past fact is dishonesty. Um, in, in respect of that, uh, do you accept that um, there is a burden of proof there? That the Secretary of State has to be satisfied, on the basis of probabilities, um, that uh, the individual was, was dishonest. That's, that's, the, that's the fact upon which the assessment is made. Then the assessment, I understand that that's an assessment. Yes, my Lord. I mean, that's really the standard of proof, and of course I accept that, that um, they, you know, there must be evidence to that standard. The Secretary of State must be um, satisfied to that standard. So, so, well. so but in terms of the assessment, if the um, uh, Secretary of State is going to rely upon dishonesty, uh, a, a past dishonest act, uh, then uh, he has to be satisfied to the civil burden of proof that the dishonesty happened. Um, yes, I think it's standard of proof, my Lord. I'm sorry, standard, I think that might be the confusion, proof, yes. So absolutely, I accept, I accept that. Well, just um, to, forgive, forgive me, sorry, had you finished? Um, yes, my well, Lord. Can, can I just ask a supplementary question then to my Lords and, and ask why burden isn't apposite in this context? Because <clears throat> it's the Secretary of State who raises the question of dishonesty. And so it, it, it could be said the Secretary of State is asserting a fact that the applicant for ILR has been dishonest. Yeah. So why is it not apt conceptually to say that the burden falls upon the Secretary of State uh, to show that the person has been dishonest? Whereas at least some, you'll show us the decision letters, no doubt, but on one reading of those decision letters, the reasoning appears to go along the lines of there is a discrepancy you had a motive for understating because then your tax liability would be less. Uh, the evidence that has been submitted does not satisfy me that uh, there was a genuine error. That, 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 that's, the, that's the kind of reasoning which appears to say, well, you've got to show me that it wasn't dishonest. Well, my Lord, two things perhaps are involved in that. Firstly, there's the legal question of proving a legal case. This is judicial review, and therefore it's best assessed whether those letters are reasonable in their approach, etc. In, in public law terms, in public law principles, was that a reasonable and rational approach to take? Are there enough reasons? Those types of analysis, analysis is, is the appropriate thing in terms of the court's role. So if it's burden of proof in terms of you know, litigation proceedings, that doesn't help. It, it must be public law. Underlying that, if what's really being said is it's not reasonable for the Secretary of State to say to an individual where it's the Secretary of State saying, um, I'm you know, concerned about uh, dishonesty here or fraud here, prove to me that those concerns are unfounded. Um, you 
going to see you immediately, is it really not very helpful in terms of proof? Because um, the particular context doesn't lend itself to that. Well, uh, you're, it's you're right, it's not proof in some litigation sense, but I think what my lords are, are probing is whether the Secretary of State, in making this decision, uh, has got to be satisfied that the dishonesty occurred, not, not satisfied that it didn't occur. Well, I think it might be better if we take this in, in the course of my submissions, but I'll answer that question in this way, that um, my essential submission is I think this idea of dishonesty and proving dishonesty is unhelpful, because when you look at the underlying rule and you look at what's required, what the public law decision-making is, it's the Secretary of State um, uh, have to decide whether or not there are reasons of character and conduct that make um, the, the presence of an individual in, in the UK undesirable. That's the context. Yes, but you can't just stop so, there. You've got to break it down. And Mr. Uh, Biggs broke it down, as far as I was concerned, uh, unless you're going to challenge this sensibly, that... Uh, Get his exact analysis, but there are essentially two stages. One is, was there uh, conduct of the relevant kind? And secondly, was it desirable? Now, on this first question, was there conduct of the relevant kind? Again, that could be variable. It might, it, there might be things which are uh, involve an element of judgment and assessment. But in this particular case, the Secretary of State has pinned her, as I think it then was, colours to the mast of a particular act of dishonesty, or possibly one of two particular acts of dishonesty, and surely that uh, is something of which she has to be satisfied that it occurred. Yes. Well, um, if that, I that's, think that's, um, I'm you accept that. With that. What I'm right. worried about is using the terminology, this really is just all about using the terminology in the type of private law analysis about burdens of proof and proving things, particularly when what's going to happen here is there might be basic primary facts. Was there a misdeclaration? Or is there just some kind of you know, glitch in the system that means it looked like there was, but there wasn't? So um, those sorts of primary facts, is there a, a, but dishonesty a primary is a primary fact? Dishonesty in this analysis is a primary fact as well. I appreciate I appreciate you you have to ultimately to infer it because you can't you're Absolutely. looking some inside someone's head. But it, for the purpose of analysis, it is a binary fact. He was dishonest or he wasn't, and the Secretary of State has got to make up her mind about whether they were dishonest. And she has got to be satisfied they were dishonest. It's not enough for her not to be satisfied they weren't. That, I think, is what all three of us are putting to you, and I yes. think you're agreeing I with it. I don't quarrel with that at all, my lord. Right, well, then we can, probably, is, is the we can probably we move, can move on. on. But all I'm worried about and flagging up is the terminology of burden and proof. Well, we'll try and avoid that. We needn't... Um, we, 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 we understood your concern about it. You've understood yeah. what we, it seems to us to be the heart of the matter. And, and, and I'd say I don't right, quarrel with it, so we have a firm basis to go forward. Then my other headline point is that... Um, and these, are, these really are just headline points, but... Before this court, there is no challenge, um, general challenge, system challenge, to the administrative review system. Um, there might be challenges as to whether there's unfairness in individual cases, but what cannot come out of this in my submission properly, and this is where I am relying on procedural requirements, is a finding that essentially all decisions made under the administrative review system or made under the, the sort of system as a whole are inherently unlawful, procedurally unfair. There might be instances where they are. So um, I, it's just that submissions have been made to say this is not a fair system, the questionnaire is not fair, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of, it's the wider aspect. Well, I, I wouldn't fair assume fair. that. I, suppose we were to take the view that in any case where there was uh, an allegation of dishonesty, the Secretary makes a finding or is minded to make a finding of dishonesty, before he or she does so, they must put that to explicitly to the uh, applicants, then it could be said the entire system is unfair because it doesn't provide for that to happen. Well, so, my lord, that, that's the 
um, point Zoe made, and sorry to interrupt, but you know, if, if the administrative re review system, this is what I'm concerned about, that um, the analysis of the administrative re review system, because of the effects across um, a lot of cases, if they're all inherently unfair because they were on the administrative review rather than an appeal system or rather than um, something of that nature. So I'm only flagging it up, my lords, when we come to the individual um, uh, instances here and deal with those particular submissions, <coughs> Um, then perhaps it can be explored further. But that is my position, that it's not at the moment appropriate. Well, uh, this is a problem, is I, I know lots of advocates do it. To say I'm, I'm just going to tell you briefly what my points are and then I'm going to make them again is not the right, not helpful, because you ne 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 necessarily we start engaging with them. Well, um, I, 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 do you want to deal with this point now or later? Later, my lord. I'm only right. trying well, to in that the case, headline answers to the questions that you posed at the beginning, just so we can see where we're going All right. shape but, my lord, if it's not helpful, then I'll just move straight on to the... Um, so we can leave those headline questions, and I'll go straight into the um, submissions. They start on page three. Um, and these are the, the introductory overarching points, and only a couple, which are essential to keep in mind in considering all the aspects of the appellant's case. The first point is that these applications have been made and the individuals have held themselves out to be highly skilled migrants. And there are requirements as to levels of education and um, a degree of um, sophistication and ability to undertake these highly skilled migrant roles is inherent in such an application. And this is relevant to um, many of the submissions that have been made one way or another. They ought to be bear in mind one one as well that the, the purpose of this, what was intended really to be quite a narrow category of um, um, ability to obtain leave to remain, it was aimed at highly skilled migrants. It was aimed at where there are gaps in the UK um, market for these highly skilled roles that can't be fulfilled from um, domestic uh, workers or EEA workers then this would enable third country workers to come in and fill those highly skilled gaps. But they were meant to be, um, it was intended, to be individuals who uh, would, uh, as I say, bring with them a certain level of um, sophistication. But in particular, um, would mainly, it was envisaged, be in the employment, as it were, would be filling these roles. What wasn't envisaged was what actually happened in the end, that this became a category of mainstream um, migration, where individuals were taking relatively junior and modestly paid roles, and then topping up with self-employed earnings um, sort of on the side, or, or another role of that nature. There, there is an entrepreneur role, if you're entrepreneur, as it were, and that has particular criteria. And this wasn't intended to be a sort of hybrid role. The other overarching overarching point is that it's a fast track route because of this highly skilled migrancy approach. And it is a five year fast track route. And this is again highly relevant to the article <coughs> eight points that are being put forward and to the um, other general submissions that are being made about the effects. Three, forgive me, 3225 is a general ground for refusal, yes. is that right? So that, that's not confined to highly skilled migrant cases, is that Not right? at all, my no. lord. And, and moreover, as I understand it, and Mr Biggs informed us yesterday, uh, it, it can be used as a basis for curtailment of leave. Um, yes, my lord, I, yes. I deal with that. But if, if it was used for curtailment well, well, of leave, yeah, then, yeah. then it would be... Yeah, so, 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 so whatever this court says about the correct interpretation of 3225 and uh, the procedure, if any, that's required for its proper application, we, we need to bear in mind that it may well have importance in other contexts as well. Um, absolutely, my lord. I don't quarrel with that. Um, I'm really dealing with the submissions in respect of these particular cases yes. and how it's set to play out in these particular cases. Right. So looking at the statutory framework, um, I've summarised there under paragraph four the 
um, issues that aren't in dispute. I thought it would be helpful for the court to sort of summarise the common ground there um, at the beginning. And you'll see that it's accepted, and it wasn't accepted previously by all the um, appellants, but it's now accepted that we're not in the territory of precedent fact. The jury decision is not sought to be circumvented, undermined, or distinguished. That it is judicial review, and when the briefs approach, um, albeit um, there's some um, dispute perhaps about how heightened scrutiny can really help in that context. It's accepting the principle that there's been a misdeclaration. In well, the I, I, is court that right? Case. Perhaps this is just, you haven't put it quite right. I think the fact that there has been a dishonest misdeclaration. Um, I, I think. I don't, th I don't think I would be, uh, Mr. Biggs accepted the mere fact of a misdeclaration is relevant. Oh, yes, no, I didn't mean it. Okay, so I can put in I can put in a dishonest note, message. So I didn't, oh, that would be the very issue, my lord. So um, yes, no, I'm not saying that he's conceded. Okay, this thank you. Um, but it, it's more that's going to the um, this is for terrorists and um, people. Yeah, we brought that point. Yeah. The um, relevant fact that the general ground of refusal is not one that means an application fully. Uh, sorry, it is relevant, but it should normally be refused. And that will come, you'll see it will come into the different stages that my learned friend Mr. Biggs put before the court. Um, and that's common ground. That it's necessary to look at the words, the 3225, um, that's common ground. And that the four examples in 3225 are destructive. I think it's the point they just these really, had. These are all the same. Yep. Your brief and then the the, points, each paragraph with the grounds of refusal had a distinct scope. And my learned friend took you through the different scope of some of the. Grant. So it would be an error of law to sort of read them all together and say um, this one, because that was said in respect of that particular ground, then that approach must be taken for this one. And then it is relevant to look at the wording, the similar wording in 32019. Um, that is the entry clearance um, provision. Um, because of time, I'm not going to take it all up, but you will remember that in 32019, there was both the same wording that we have here, about undesirability, character conduct, and um, associations, and separately, non-conducive to the public good. So that tells you that in these rules, those are two distinct concepts. And that goes to the submission that, in effect, because, you, because there's a decision that the presence is undesirable, that necessarily means the Secretary of State must remove the person. That's deportation. Um, conducive to the public good. It's clearly different. So if we look at the um, effect of refusal of ILR, there was a lot of submissions um, about that, and it's important at the beginning in my submission to get to the bottom of how this all comes in. And my submission is very clearly that a refusal of ILR under this five-year route is not a decision to control leave. I understand that the paragraph 3225 may then come up and there may be a con curtailment decision, but it is a separate decision that can be challenged in its own right and if it's not right to curtail, because it is a necessarily different decision and I'm a bit surprised that um, they would be run together because it's one thing to say um, we're not going to grant settlement to someone. It's another thing to say somebody who's enjoying settlement and has, has had the benefit of that should have it taken away because of something that they have done. Um, certainly in our late terms, it involves a different analysis. And it is a separate decision. So it is not reasonable to rely on the paragraph 3225 grounds to curtail. Then um, that will be um, something that's considered subject to judicial scrutiny. So it's not a night follows day, and it doesn't mean that necessarily these wider implications would happen and that they no, would happen. No, but in, in, in the typical case, and you would disagree with that, in these cases, because uh, by the time the decision is made on ILR, the limited leave has expired, this is Mr. Biggs's point, the effect in practice, functionally, is that they will, as from that moment, have no leave and become overstayers. That is his point. I think he accepts that um, formally it is a different decision, but it is a decision that has those effects. And that's the case you have to meet. Um, 
I'm absolutely my lords, but I want to be very clear about it because it does matter. I, I know, is, uh, but, that, I, um, but it is that we have got the point. Has expired. Yes. Um, that's from whence the consequences flow. I understand that. But, um, it, the, um, it's not the end as well. I think that you know, there's been a certain amount of um, assumption that you know, this is all set in stone, it's the end, and that means that um, you know, you'll be condemned to live in the UK without any prospect of leave, um, or, you, or you have to leave the UK. But there's nothing wrong with a, a person who's an overstayer, prima facie, being um, not entitled to remain in the UK, and that, that's just simply a consequence of being an overstayer. What would be problematic is if there was no route, if you did have an article 8 right, if you did have you know, established right, um, or even a case on compassionate or discretionary grounds, if this INR decision meant you were closed off from accessing those, there's a safety net as well, a removal safety net under the rules. Um, if, if this INR decision meant automatically you were cut off from access to those types of considerations and then judicial scrutiny of those, that would be a different case. But that is not this case. It's not, this is not the end of the matter. I don't understand. I'm sorry, I'm not following this. It's my fault. Uh, leave aside Article 8 for the time being if we can, right? Just leave that aside for now. As a matter of domestic immigration law, isn't the position that by the time that the refusal of ILR comes through, the state is taking the position vis-a-vis -vis this individual, you have no legal permission to be in this country at all. And, and therefore, what we expect you to do is leave. Uh, and, and if you don't leave, in the meantime, the various statutory consequences which flow from being in this country without leave are going to apply to you. For example, you can't uh, rent premises from a landlord, uh, you can't have a bank account, you can't have a driving license, etc., etc. I and mean, what's the point of having all those raft of measures unless it is to make it absolutely clear to an individual that you are not welcome here, you should go voluntarily? Well, well, that's certainly right in, in principle, but in this context, what happens is there's a refusal of leave, and with that, there's an immediate inquiry. Are there any other reasons um, why um, you consider that you should be permitted to remain in the UK? So, Just from, I'm sure you're clear, right. Did, what is that? Say, it says that in the decision letter, um, does well, it? Do you want to show us? There's a notice that's served straight away, um, a section 120 notice um, that's served straight away with the, with the refusal letter that invites... Um, uh, we've got examples in the bundle, haven't we? Have my, my junior will, will give the page number for you. So it's not the Secretary of State signalling, in this case, that's the end of the consideration. Well, I, well so. it depends what you mean. Certainly the letters I've seen, I haven't seen the Section 120 notices, say at the end, now you're not entitled to be here, you must make arrangements to go. Yeah. That is what the decision letter says. The fact that you may have, and, you, and if you're right, are reminded that you may have some other basis on which you could apply and leave it up to you to apply is not inconsistent with that. No, not at all, my lord. The, the, I mean, it may be people haven't got any reason to remain in the UK, in which case it's appropriate. And I think it might even be a judicial decision that said that it was necessary to point out to people that they ought to leave the UK if they've got no right to be here. I can't remember if that did stem from a judicial decision. But that's all that's happening now, that... Um, because, and it's because your current leave has expired, not just the refusal of ILR, your current leave has expired, um, you're being refused what you applied for here, um, therefore, uh, as is common ground, um, you have no, currently no extant entitlement to remain in the UK. But it does come with a notice immediately. Well, I think we're, we're making a, a lot of, a, of, a, of an obvious point. And I don't think there's any disagreement. If your only point is that if you've got some other right to be there, you, of course, have the right to be here, you have the right to uh, make an appropriate application, and subject to Mr Malik finding us the, uh, the evidence of this, you are reminded of that, fine. I mean, but I'm not sure that meets Mr Biggs's point. Well, what I'm dealing with here is the characterisation of the ILR decision that is being put before the court. And it's been said to be a de facto removal decision. It's said, you know, a lot of qualities have been attributed to the ILR decision. And it matters, my lord, because 
if there's going to be an extension, if there's going to be a, a, a quasi appeal or, or some consequence of this ILR decision, it's important to identify what element it is in it. Is it because it leaves you with no means? Is it because it engages Article 8 in some other way? Is it um, and all I'm getting well, let's leave Article 8 out of it, but uh, I agree with my Lord. For accurate analysis, it's very important that we do. We may come in later for other issues. Yeah. But it is, Mr. Bean says, if you like, a de facto removal decision in this sense <laughs> that uh, it renders you liable to removal. The letter actually has a heading, liability for removal. Um, uh, it is true, obviously, that then some a further decision with a small d to implement that will have to be taken. If you're going to be put on a plane or something, somebody's going to come and collect you and give you notice they're going to do it. But in law, your liability for removal is established by this decision. That's Mr. Beach's point, and it must be right, mustn't it? So your liability for removal is because you have no extension. Yes, but it, this is the decision, leave. which means you haven't got any leave. For a certain type of leave, um, and it's been refused. It doesn't make you in itself liable for removal. As I say, well, perhaps let's come on to this under the Article um, Eight submissions because it's. Um, all right. Well, okay, we'll come. I, we have your point. I think that's the important point. Um, the important point um, uh, it's just of how far it goes. The point I wanted to make very clear at the beginning is what I say the decision is. Um, you may not accept my submissions on that, but. It is my clear submission it's not a de facto removal decision. And I'm at the moment just headlining. And I will get into the meat of it. Um, I, I, I'd like to know two things at some, at some point. Uh, firstly, um, uh, after a, um, a 3225 decision, um, what else needs to be done uh, to remove? We've been told purely the um, uh, issue of removal violation. But uh, I'd like confirmation of that. Secondly, um, I, I would like to see uh, an example of a section 120 notice. Yes, well, my, my Lord, I'll, yeah. I'll come to it in due course. I'm grateful for Thank that indication. So, having done the headlines, um, it's, and, and perhaps the other headline is, of course, that this isn't a, the place to debate um, whether or not the hostile environment is a, a good idea, an acceptable idea from a humanitarian point of view, or, or, or things of that nature. I think the court's really already flagged this up. Um, and it is really the Article 8 point, but the overarching submission is really that you can't extend um, Article 8 to cover matters that ought to be covered because there's been a change of government policy or something that's considered to be um, unacceptable. Um, that's not the route um, in my submission. Which part of your speaking notes are we on now? Um, paragraph 12. Uh, paragraph 10. Sorry? So, so I don't want to labour these introductory No, no, things. fine. <laughs> it, it, uh, the only th uh, you'd skipped over nine, and I. Um, Patel is really effectively um, the same point as I raised Mr. Beards under the heading of Daily Murdoch because I wasn't up to date with the latest case. But um, Mr. Biggs did say why uh, this was not the same point as the Daily Murdoch point. One point was that the uh, different statutory regime. Uh, the second point is perhaps the one you just just uh, 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 addressed. But do you want to say any more about Daily Murdoch or Patel, or um, is, is it enough I'll, there in I'll, Paranine? Yeah, I'm flagging up my sort of overarching point there. I'll come to it in the... Oh, I see. Um, so this... Wait, do, we, just to set the scene, uh, my is Lord. It, all right. So that, but, so that it is clear. Well, well again, I'm sorry, Zant, I said to you earlier, it's not terribly helpful to have a flagging of the points but then whenever we ask questions about them, saying I'm actually going to make the point itself later. Well, I, I did try, my lord, at the beginning to indicate that these were my overarching submissions, whether you agreed with them or not, and that I would develop them, but I wanted to be very clear what they were at the beginning, so I you see. knew okay, well, we'll, uh, if, if you want to come back to all of these shape. points, we, right, we, we'll... I'll give you the shape of things to come. All right, very well. So, I won't ask um, any questions. Um, no, not at all, my lord, but um, I just wanted to... It was intended to help by giving, as I say, the shape okay. of things to come. That the scope... Um, of um, 3225. These are the interpretation points so where my learned friend Mr. Biggs. Wh which pair are we on now? 13, yes, I see. Eight, yeah, paragraph 13. That, um, I, it's common ground now in, in response to a question from, from my Lord, um, Lord Justice Singh that, <coughs> in principle, there's nothing 
um, this is the category points, that there's nothing that means that 3225 couldn't on its own. Well, you've made that point already, yeah. So it comes to then um, how do we approach whether it is one of those cases that falls within um, the scope of the rule um, in practice. And my learned friend has helpfully broken it down into a two-stage approach. Um, my only point about that, my lord, I don't really quarrel with analysing it in that way. I'm worried, though, my lord, it might be taken too far and turn into a sort of process, um, perhaps not by this court, but by others reading things, into a sort of process that has to be followed. And if that rigorous process isn't followed, if there isn't a paragraph on this or a point on that or something, well, then there's a procedural failure. Isn't it actually helpful for a decision maker where the rule explicitly or by necessary implication requires them to go through certain stages, it makes for good decision making to require them to deal with each point in turn. And absolutely, my lord, if going forward, um, you know, this can be adopted in this particular um, teasing out way, then of course that's, um, that's helpful guidance. Um, but the concern is that obviously the hundreds of these decisions, if they're all bolstered by um, you know, a tribunal on the basis of, well, you know, I'm looking for stage two here, what's the, what's limb, you know, what's the limb three conclusion under stage one? Um, you can see that because it's, as the, you know, in the old days things were looked at in the round, these days there is a tendency to say, right, let's work through, let's tick off the boxes, let's, and that's all I'm saying is that it's a helpful analysis it does help to break down what the ingredients are, um, but it's not a process that's obligatory in itself in terms of public law error if you haven't done it. So looking at the stages, the first stage, um, Lim 1, um, it's accepted essentially what my learned friend says, that there does need to be reliable evidence of a significant discrepancy. This isn't the territory of transposing figures, um, making slips, uh, one-off errors of a, a nature that are readily explainable um, as purely administrative um, insignificant errors that don't bear on character and conduct in themselves. There needs to be reliable evidence of something um, that's significant. And it is accepted in the authorities, and my submission correctly so, and it may be that there's a concertineering of, of the stages that's led to a sort of idea that there's a presumption but it is accepted that, in principle, the, the um, ingredients here of a significant difference in the declaration <coughs> and um, an inadequate explanation or, or no explanation, prima facie, might raise the, the question of kind of character and conduct concerns, but each case must be then examined individually to see, well, what is the explanation or are all the circumstances? So that stage one, I think, is really um, mainly common ground. It's stage two that I think is the perhaps main difference of approach. And it is to do with this word dishonesty. That whilst dishonesty may well be the best way of expressing most of these cases um, what the relevant character and conduct element is in most of these cases, there is a concern that it if it becomes a term of art in itself, if it becomes a substitution of a test of dishonesty, then that is where we get into ideas of um, uh, what does dishonesty particularly mean. And, and it, if it's then important from other areas, what dishonesty means in other areas, what a general definition of dishonesty is, what's a, a dictionary definition of dishonesty, as you sometimes do see, my lord, there will be submissions that um, this is what dishonesty means generally, this case is not that. And in, it's that which is... But in every context now, it's been made easier since Ivy, in every context where uh, dishonesty is an issue, whether it's a decision maker, administrative decision maker having to make, take a view on dishonesty, or a court, civil or um, uh, criminal, it's now been clarified what dishonesty means may be difficult in a particular case to decide whether someone's dishonest or not. But there's no legal or conceptual difficulty about, di about dishonesty. We all know what it means. And uh, I can't see what the problem is. My Lord, as long as it's a sufficiently wide definition, 
definition, as it were, to encompass the time... The, the, what do you mean wide? Dishonesty. There is a definition of dishonesty insofar as it's possible, well, and it's not wide or narrow, it is just dishonest. Perhaps I can explain it by reference to an example. But in the al Fayed case, um, there was um, what was called a want of probity um, by the court that was relevant to character in that case. And the situation was, um, and my Lord um, Lord Justin will know better than me, but Mr. Alphard was in a position of responsibility in charge of some um, safety deposit boxes and knowingly allowed them to be interfered with um, without intervening to um, stop that conduct happening, that illicit conduct happening. And the court said that is a, a relevant to character. Uh, I'm sorry, um, we're cross purposes. When I was, uh, I was meaning in the context of this point about discrepant tax returns. I can imagine in the case of how someone exercises the stewardship of a company or whatever it might be, other concepts might be relevant. I'm not sure they are because the tendency has been to run all these other old, rather old-fashioned men we don't want to probity into dishonesty. But we don't need to go there. We're talking about this particular context. If dishonesty means want of, can mean want of probity, then I've got no issue with it. But in this particular context, my Lord, to answer that question... I'm sorry, but, it, 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 I'm sorry, but as my Lord said, it doesn't. Dishonesty means what, what the Supreme Court said it means. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, you, you're right in saying that the uh, that 3225 doesn't refer to dishonesty. It refers to, to, to uh, conduct. But as my Lord said, in the context that we're dealing with, which is a discrepancy between declared income for revenue and for uh, home office purposes. That's what we're talking about. In all the letters, uh, it, it is said by the Secretary of State, uh, this is dishonest or deceitful. We are in the, we're in the region of um, uh, uh, dishonesty. There are many other ways in which you might uh, be undesirable uh, in the Secretary's uh, eyes, not involving dishonesty. Um, but in this context, it's dishonesty, isn't it, or nothing? Well, my lord, I accept that for these cases. The point well, I'm making is this is guide, guide. guide I think we can we can cut this short by saying that, speaking for myself and it's pretty clear for my lords as well, we will be careful to say nothing about dishonesty being required in every three two two five context. Um, but this case is about a particular context, and in that context speaking for myself, at the moment, I would have thought dishonesty is required, and I don't actually understand the Secretary of State as anything different. Well, my Lord, uh, perhaps a way of illustrating is my learned friend said that recklessness wouldn't be covered by 3225. So say you approached your affairs, put in your personal declaration to the um, HMRC, or perhaps a witness statement to this court, you know, where you actually approach it on the place of, well, I don't know if it's right or wrong, because... Actually, well, uh, there's plenty of law that's dishonest. Then, if you put down a figure and say, well, it might be right, but I didn't happen much bother to check whether it's right or not, uh, that uh, often can be, well, that is dishonest. Well, that's, uh, I forget, one of the big 19th century cases, my lords yeah. will remember at once I'm which ones. I'm perfectly content with that then, my lords, because my learned friend was drawing a distinction between recklessness, you know, negligence, that sort of, but, I mean, negligence in the sense of dishonest negligence, you know, sort of uh, indifference to the... You're degree, blurring you know, what is a perfectly you know, straightforward test, dishonesty. Well, my lord... And, and I'm not, I don't want to go into can negligence be dishonest, can recklessness be dishonest. It's just making difficult what is in fact easy. And my Lord, I only do it because I anticipate that there may well be um, ingenious submissions that are put forward to say that, well, looking at the mind of the person, because we're looking at the mind of the person, it's said, a subjective evaluation, you can't say they're dishonest because. In their mind, they didn't intend to deceive, or they didn't, um, because, as I say, they may have just been... Well, they'll, everyone will go back to Ivy if they really need to. Right. Well, and, my Lord, and we'll apply the Ivy test. Actually, you don't normally need to. And all I really, I suppose, want to say is that in the con this context, that test can cover these types of scenarios. As, you know, it is apt to dishonesty in that it is not to be taken as something that's sort of narrow, um, that it is, it is broad enough to cover the types of circumstances where you may actually have been um, making personal declarations without the due um, care and ensuring they're correct. When you say this is accurate, it is dishonest to say it's accurate if you really don't know it's either way. And 
I think it's Derry and Peak, by the way. But I, that's really my, my look. Because as long as that, all I'm concerned about is that that point's aired, so that we don't then have you know sort of follow-on cases that say, oh well, that was a sort of you know um, a restrictive approach. So and and of course you'll see them most of the cases. The individual said they believed it to be true, um, but that shouldn't be the end of the matter. Um, and I've made that point, that whether or not it's a reasonable belief. Um, where, where are we now? Um, we're, uh, we're at the end of 20, really, well, middle of 20. Right. But, okay. um, so, it's, as I say, the particular clear example that comes up again and again is the wholly and exclusively test. The, it's, it's pretty clear the wholly and exclusively test for deduction of expenses in the self-employed context. There's plenty of guidance about it. But again and again, you'll see whole rafts of expenses um, being um, deducted in the tax returns. Now, one or two, if, if it's obscure, there might be a case where you know it, it is ex obscure whether it falls within that test or you know is there personal use. You know, there might be those cases around the margins, in which case you get advice. What you don't do is think, well, I think they should be deductible, or I think they are deductible. I'm not going to check whether they're properly deductible. And I'm going to deduct whole rafts, whole pages of expenses. Um, <coughs> in my submission, that's dishonest conduct. And if that is dishonest, um, there's no problem with the term dishonest. I mean, you might believe it to be them to be deductible, but that's because you've placed yourself in a position where you haven't actually looked at the rules or applied the rules or done what would be reasonable, which is um, seek expert advice if you're not capable of filling in the so, if the term reprehensible conduct can cover all this, um, then perhaps I don't have an, an argument with reprehensible conduct. But um, I in my submission, all I'm concerned about is these terms being terms of art and then having their own particular um, definition that then restricts the rule, because the rule doesn't do that. It may be we all know what we're talking about, and so there isn't a worry, but... Um, sometimes these can develop um, by using particular terms. Then limb three, uh, this is the assessment of uh, whether or not the conduct means um, that it's undesirable due to reasons of character and conduct <coughs> for the individual to remain in the UK. And it's common ground this isn't a balancing exercise. And I think I've been over this already. The problem is, if you say balancing exercise, particularly in first year tribunal, then immediately these are not legally qualified people. They go straight into Article 8 mode of balancing individual rights against collective rights. So it's again just a, a, a please be, um, um, it's a common ground, please, the uh, language of assessment. It's, it's, it's not a balancing exercise in that sense. Uh, but but in, in um, determining whether some uh, particular conduct uh, is means the presence in the UK is undesirable, you don't simply look at the conduct on which you're focused. Yeah. So, for example, um, we may say that such and such is undesirable conduct, um, but you, you have to take into account, don't you, in, in determining whether presence is undesirable, you know, other factors. For example, presence, there may be factors which makes presence desirable. Yeah. And, and then, uh, I, I appreciate you, it's not a, an article balancing exercise, but you do have to um, put, put, it, put them all into an assessment. Yeah, exactly. It's the assessment, my lord. That what you're weighing is, well, what you're determining is the public interest. Is it undesirable yeah. in the public interest as personal so and, and, and it is a little bit like paragraph 276B, where we looked at the public interest there, and what you have to come up with at the end of the day is the overall public interest, and there might be factors pointing one way, factors pointing the other. Um, I think an example might be, well, there may have been dishonesty here, but if someone risks their life for the country, perhaps sustains an injury, then that is something where, you know, on the public interest level, they've done that. You know, it's, it's not just carrying on your ordinary life for your own private interests and not committing any crimes. It's not that. Um, and then you'll see that's quite often put forward, you know, this person sort of, um, always been a good, you know, sort of uh, friend or something of that nature. It is at this public interest level, um, and perhaps it's one of those things you can't define until you actually see it. But it should be quite obvious, really, what those ones that operate, those factors, countervailing factors that operate at that level are, so you can come to an overall assessment. 
Um, and that is different, and I'm grateful to my learned friend for distinguishing it from this second stage discretion, which is not factors relevant to the public interest, but they might be factors um, relevant to a wider consideration because of the effects of refusal. So it's not about whether in that public interest it's desirable or not for the person to be in the UK. It's overall making a rational assessment and taking into account something that, um, in, in a proportionality with a small p, perhaps, something of that nature. But again, it only arises where the person puts forward or where there is obviously, self-evidently, factors that go to that. Because the normal rule is, um, if your presence is undesirable, you know, it will be a refusal of settlement. So it's departure from the normal rule. It's the analysis of um, you've got a published policy, you've got to adhere to your published policy, and there's good reason to depart from it. So um, what you don't have to do is give a good reason for applying your published policy. So you're not looking in the refusal letters every single time for, um, you know, I have exercised my discretion, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, there have been many cases not recently, where that was sort of um, uh, a, a fault that was pointed out, oh, well, you haven't said why you're applying the rules. And um, in my submission, only where it's raised um, that there is something that's genuinely relevant to the exercise of that discretion. And it's a residual discretion. Is that, does that mean only raised by, I mean, where it is no. raised, would normally be raised by the individual? Yeah. Um, normally, my lords. And, and I'm not excluding that um, there might be instances where it's self-evident from the the file, as it were, but there's not an obligation on the Secretary of State to sort of search out um, things that might weigh um, the other way, as it were. I mean, you'd hope that they were, um, because this is an ILR application, it's on a particular process under a points based system. Um, as I say, there are other opportunities at the removal stage to take account of things that um, are of a wider nature. Here it says the normal rule is you will be refused if there's the Give this, this second stage discretion, I think, I think it's a, um, one, of, one of the matters that has, has to be taken into account um, um, at, at, at a part of Blade's life at this stage. Yeah. Um, no, I, think I would say under this application, my Lord, I'll, I'll come on, but my answer to that is no. Um, these are points-based system caseworkers, right, who are dealing with applications under the points-based system. So, so what that comes in at the second stage of discretion? Something, if there is something obviously on the file, um, that, and, it, and it's actually, I mean, as I say, people do say, um, uh, I mean, it, it's not, that's why I'm minimising it, my lord, because later there will be the chance, when it comes to removal, to raise all those other issues that aren't really desirability of presence in the UK issues. I understand um, that, but so, so give, give me an example of, of, of what doesn't come under the desirability, undesirability assessment does come within the second stage discretion if it's not half of if it's not human rights? Um, well, it may be something that doesn't operate in terms of the, um, as my laws indicated, in terms of desirability to be in the UK. So it's not something that makes it positively desirable for a person to be in the UK, which is what the assessment is under limb three of the first. It's, is there something positively that shows it's desirable? You've got that assessment, so yes, it's undesirable. Now you're looking at um, are there any other reasons for departing from your normal policy? Um, I don't really want to be tied to examples, but perhaps it might be um, a, a um, consideration of something that um, it can't really be, it'd have to probably be individual rights rather than the public interest because that's already been covered. Um, individual rights? Such well, individual as interest, perhaps a better way of putting it. But, um, individual interest, such as? Yeah. Um, perhaps uh, to finish a course, um, you're engaged. Well, in what about ill health? I mean, I think your problem, I think your concern about Article Eight, is not to um, exclude sorts of points which we are increasingly used to categorising as Article Eight points. Someone is on their deathbed or something, which we would certainly. Um, see in Article 8 terms nowadays. But in fact, if Article 8 didn't exist, uh, common law, that might well be a re relevant reason uh, for saying, well, perhaps deathbed's a bad example because uh, the ILR, ILR is not really um, uh, needed, but there might be a health reason why, or depend somebody else dependent, somebody else dependent on them. Uh, 
your concern, I think, is that if you're going to put deal with those with an Article 8 label, then procedurally you must take a different route. Yeah. Um, and, have I got that right? Yes, my Lord. It's, it's so uh, it may be that some of the... You, you, I can see your mind worrying, trying to think of things that didn't come under Article 8. But in fact, I think conceptually, quite a lot of Article 8 considerations might come in under the second stage discretion, but not if called Article 8. They'd have to be matters which, if Article 8 never existed, would be matters which the, uh, a reasonable decision maker uh, might take into account as saying, very well, I will give you, in fact, I, get I will give you leave to remain, or I won't curtail your existing leave, um, because dot, dot, dot. I made it too difficult for myself yeah, by saying it has to be an ILR case because actually 3225 will apply in other cases which have nothing to do with ILR. Um, yes, although I think that is the difficulty actually. I just thought my um, educational example isn't a good one because if really what you're going to give someone is settlement. And there are other routes for giving them limited leave or giving them tolerance from being removed. <coughs> so it's disproportionate to give settlement to Article Yes, but sorry, 3225 so isn't only related to cases of settlement. No, but that's my point. Yeah. Yes, I think that's right, my Lord. And therefore, it's easier, if you think of non-settlement cases, to think of things somebody may, my illness case might be, well, there, you would normally curtail, but actually they're ill, uh, and they can finish their treatment in six months, and their leave will come to an end in that time anyway, so I won't curtail. That would be a, that would be a second stage application. Yeah. Um, my Lord, just by way of detail, um, it by way of information, that the points-based case worker wouldn't be making curtailment decisions. That it would, if, if there was a, a, an intention to curtail, it would go to a different decision well, maker. Uh, who would, but don't, so it's not like don't blur it by yeah. talking about what would happen. In fact, we're talking right. about the, the, the structure of the yeah. rule. So just on structure, my Lord, this is really my main point about Article 8, that those um, factors are better considered under Article 8, but not within this rubric, because... The Article 8 consideration is something really that, that is wider, because what it might say is, well, um, uh, these are the individual rights you know, that have been put forward. Um, this is the paragraph 3225 event or issue or assessment, or whatever you want to call it. Um, either that might be examined and say, no, it's wrong, you know, or it might be said, well, even if all that is right, it's not... Um, a justification for this level of interference. So the article <laughs> analysis is fundamentally different. It's not the ILR application analysis, which is shall we depart from our normal policy because we've been given a reason, not relevant to desirability, we've been given a reason, another reason, um, that all those considerations can come under the article 8, you know, apply under article 8, all your um, the proposals from well, can, can we leave eight. procedure out? There's a procedural point which we're going to have to come to separately, but I don't find it helpful at this stage to consider procedure. I would have thought in, in simply in terms of uh, whether there might be a breach of article 8 by the action, by, by uh, the, whatever the refusal is that's in, that's in issue. Uh, I don't see why we shouldn't do it any differently from how we normally do it. Uh, you know that Article 8 requires you to take into account these various considerations. Uh, if you can do so within the rules, you do it within the rules. If you can't do it within the rules, you have to do it outside the rules. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, and it may therefore, on that basis, it might well be possible to bring Article 8 in under the second stage of 3225 probably would. But it doesn't really matter, except for the procedural point, which I'm not allowing you to go to. Yeah. Well, my Lord, I think it is that. But we're clear anyway, it must be common ground, that the discretion, this I would say a residual discretion, but this discretion at the second stage is a discretion of shall we depart from a normal policy um, because of these factors that have been put forward. Um, and it is on the basis where the public interest has clearly already been established as um, it is undesirable for this person to be present in the UK. So, if, I'm sorry, if, if, if that's right, that, that um, this, this second stage discretion, as you call it, as everybody's called it, um, <coughs> considers um, matters that would mean a departure from the normal rule on the basis of various factors, which you said have been put forward. 
Um, but I, 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 I struggle there a bit because in these ILR cases, so somebody fills in the form and says, I earn £40,000 or whatever they say, um, and uh, you, you then investigate it. Um, you, you say that there's no obligation to, to, to make any inquiries of, of, of anybody, including inquiries of the applicant themselves, before you determine the application. But, but um, uh, whatever these factors might be under the second stage of discretion, whether they're part of age or education or um, uh, common law um, uh, practice that would have been taken into account, uh, how can you expect anybody to put that on the original form? They'd have to look forward and think, well, I'd better say that I've got a poorly child, and it's just not. Well, my Lord, that's exactly my point. That's why this isn't the apt way of doing it. But just go, to go back to the analysis, that um, if what's happening is that um, a person has applied for settlement, right, they haven't met the criteria, um, if what we're really analysing is whether is it proportionate to apply paragraph 325 in this case, um, because it might have serious consequences. Um, in my submission, it's better to deal with those consequences and perhaps even really look at 3225 um, in the light of those consequences under the right approach. Because if you um, don't act on the, um, if, if you build it into this application, what happens is you give settlement. You give settlement to someone who normally, or a normal rule would mean their presence is you know, undesirable in the UK because of character and et etc. But you've already decided you know, their presence is undeniable. Um, and now you're giving them settlement. And that just seems intrinsically wrong. If you want to deal with these problems of maybe they've got a sick child, they need to be in the UK on temporary leave or limited leave or, or even for a substantial period in order to allow that to be dealt with, then the better way to deal with that is by limited leave, not by granting an application for R&R. If you remember, well, 3225 isn't always in an ILR situation. No, I know, my lord, but that's what we're dealing with here. That's what... The, what's being, perhaps we're always going over to the procedural points and it's hard to separate them out. But really well, let's, shall we park is, this for the moment and come back to the procedural points? We yeah. uh, understand what, what your concern is. So, right. Um, if, if we then look at the um, question of Khan, um, I'm not going to go into all the details on this because we haven't really got time, but Khan is a useful summary of, of the case law and the approach, and perhaps that's the way of getting at um, a lot of those sort of underlying questions that have been raised one way or another. And the Secretary of State, I mean, it's not wholly favourable to the Secretary of State, Khan, as it were. It's not, you'll see it's quite rigorous in, in some ways, although the head note doesn't actually, in fact, it would help perhaps if we um, turned it up, because the head note that caused the um, concern um, really probably doesn't summarise very well. my submission is that it's a reasonable summary of the existing jurisprudence, the weight of the existing jurisprudence, because there are individual cases that go both ways, um, and it guidance as to approach, which is acceptable guidance. Um, it's not, the head note isn't to be taken and read as a sort of semantic, uh, in a semantic way, as a, a straitjacket. Um, it is just showing what's a broadly reasonable approach in, in the hope of consistency, because you'll see that uh, the other tribunal has been really being consistent to these cases because it's been informed about the content. Um, and this is what's good. So it's the bit that I think was um, really of, uh, of concern was the um, part of the head note that, that seemed to create sort of presumption of um, uh, dishonesty. Um, but actually, if you look at paragraph 32, which is where... Which the judgment expressly said it's got to be um, read in the context of that. Um, you'll see that what the judge does is very much put that as a starting point. The starting point seems to mean that the Secretary of State discovers a significant difference between the income claim. 
contained in the previous application for new domain, and the income declared for it from RCA this year. You're entitled to draw an inference, that's all it is, um, that the asset has been deceitful or dishonest and therefore should be received RLR. But it's important to note that, however, it does not follow that. In such cases, the decision to refuse RLR will be lawful. And then it goes on where the actor has presented the evidence, etc., etc. The Secretary is presented with a fact finding task which must be carried out fairly and lawfully. Yeah, but I think the difficulty yeah. is, and uh, these points do run into one another, that under the present system, the applicant has no opportunity to present evidence. Um, well, that's, that's a separate point, my Lord. Well, that, yes, I know, but... Uh, just to deal with the calm point, that um, all I'm dealing with now is whether or not um, this court can essentially um, <coughs> take calm as a reasonable approach overall. And as I say, it doesn't make... Well, speaking for myself, I have no difficulty <laughs> with... The concept that where the secretary is presented with a discrepancy, particularly given the fact that undoubtedly in some of these cases it is because one or other has been dishonest, uh, th there is something that needs to be followed up. Uh, but in a normal situation, that the next step would be for the Secretary of State to say, well, there's the here's a discrepancy. What is, uh, ignoring language of proof, prima facie case or burden of proof or whatever, something that calls for an explanation, what is your explanation? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> if that was what the judge was clearly saying here, I would have, speaking for myself and provisionally and all the rest of it, no difficulty with it. And that's all my point is. Right, but that does put, then put a very heavy burden on the procedural fairness point, which you're going to come to. Well, but I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. I just sort of con confirm that, that, that you do accept that. What my understanding of this paragraph is that um, uh, the judge at the bottom of page 1866, where it says that the Secretary of State is entitled to draw an inference that the applicant has been deceitful or dishonest, he meant a factual inference. What my Lord says is, well, he would be satisfied if he meant she's entitled to have a suspicion that the applicant has been deceitful or honest. That's a different thing. You accept, though, that it should be suspicion, not inference. Well, because it because it's that's very important. I think, to be fair to him, I think what he's really dealing with is the argument that's often put that, well, um, this I, I'm, is I'm sorry, to inter I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt because we may never know what the judge was thinking. What I'd like to know is what your submission is. Do you accept uh, that it's uh, a suspicion that the Secretary of State uh, is entitled to draw, uh, not a, a factual inference? I think the judge uses prima facie case. And um, could we say a reasonable basis to consider that um, there may be dishonesty subject to considering what um, explanation there is and... There is a sufficient basis. Of I mean, that. suspicion may, might might not be the exactly yeah, the right word, but, but 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 it, it, it's not a, a, a fact, an inference as a matter of fact, a factual inference. It, it, it's not a conclusion. Yes. It's as the judge said, the starting yes. point. But yes. this is a reasonable starting point. Yes. Are you happy with something that calls for an explanation? Reasonable basis for thinking something that calls for an explanation. Yeah, but a little bit more, my lord. Um, I think there's that extra element <coughs> of, and if there isn't a reasonable explanation for it, it is sort of a, a proper basis on which dishonesty might be concluded. It, there's just that extra yes. that, that um, you're in the territory. But, but then, of course, the seat, you are then in an... If that has... The game changes at the moment where there is, an ex, where there is a yes, call for an explanation it, and there isn't an explanation given, then the failure to give an explanation is itself, as it were, confirms the suspicion, if you like, um, or can do. Uh, uh, My only but but, uh, but it is, I'm afraid, impossible to really separate this out from the fact that there isn't here an opportunity to explain. Well, Lord, I will come on to that. You know, okay. Well, what, again, what we're, what we're, uh, but thank you. I think you were right to focus on this paragraph because it is very important, yeah. and I think we see what your position on it is. Yeah, it, it's more that my learned friends made the submission that while lots of people do things for lots of different reasons, you can't think they're dishonest just because 
there's a discrepancy there, you know, i.e. there's nothing that can be attributed to in terms of honesty or dishonesty or anything of that nature, any suspicion, I don't, you know, it's difficult to put a word in it. And all this is really saying is, in this context, with these ingredients, um, there is enough there to have a reasonable basis for considering that um, subject to any explanation, subject to explanation, this is a starting point, it's a reasonable starting point. Um, the Secretary of State doesn't have to start from the point that you are, all things are equal. You know. um, so then um, the rest of Khan, I do think it's really objectionable. I think the, the only objections that have really been made to it by my learned friends are, are things that aren't in there, so it doesn't concern the tame side. Um, yeah, it doesn't, um, perhaps my Lord um, talked about procedural rights and ability to put in evidence. It doesn't expressly say, and I've taken account of how difficult it might be to put in evidence, things of those nature. They're sort of omissions, but um, in my submission, that that's not a reason to disapprove of Khan or to say it's not a helpful summary of what it does say. So um, that, that's the, and it saves an awful lot of time in me making submissions on all these individual points that come up in these cases. Um, I stand by Khan essentially as a reasonable approach to those. And one that the um, tribunals in these particular appeals has, has applied. Um, so then the, the question is um, this difficult question of, um, well, I think, should we go to procedural fairness next, my lord? And well, I, myself, I would find that helpful, yes. Yeah, so if we flip forward to um, procedural fairness, it's dealt with fairly um, lightly in the um, note. Um, but I think it's all agreed what the general principles of fairness are. And my learned friend put them in terms of um, you have to uh, be aware of the issue, I put that in neutral terms, um, and you have to have the opportunity to uh, put forward your side of the case, put forward an explanation, however you want to put it in context, however you want to um, uh, phrase it, there has to be an opportunity to uh, explain the issue, explain your, um, why it's not dishonesty or why um, things happened the way they did. There's several different elements to what the explanation might be because you're going to have the sort of pure factual explanation of this is how it came about and then you um, would explain and this is why, um, although it might look like it was dishonest or negligent or all these things, in fact it wasn't because. Um, so in my submission, just stating the broad principles though, um, doesn't mean that uh, you really know how they have to apply on the ground in the individual cases. Um, and the approach that the tribunals have taken to this, in my submission, has been a reasonable approach. You'll see the tribunals have looked at, is there really knowledge? Because if somebody already has knowledge of the issue and has proffered an explanation, then it would be strange indeed for the Secretary of State to have to sort of put it to them in some way or to have to explain... Well, hang on, yes, but I, in, in all of these cases, say, <coughs> Kawos, and rather peculiarly Baladugari, because there had already in, been a, uh, two sets of proceedings, another set of proceedings, but in the, in the, in the vanilla case, uh, the applicant doesn't know there's an issue. The first they know there's an issue is when they get the decision letter. Well, it is true they know that they um, have uh, that there's a discrepancy at any rate in those again typical cases where they corrected it in the meantime. <coughs> but they don't know that the um, discrepancy is going to be said to be dishonest. There is that element, my lord. Just <laughs> dealing with the discrepancy to begin with. No, I'm just separating it out for the um, purposes of analysis. That. Um, and that's really how the tribunal has done it, that in, in the procedural fairness um, law, context is everything. And so it must matter um, the context in terms of all the elements. So the first element is, do you know, because it's been raised earlier, do you know there's a discrepancy? Um, it may be that some people say, I just didn't realise there was a discrepancy at all. And there's that I point. think these are all cases where there's been a, an amendment. That's and that is the typical kind of case that's generated a controversy. Presumably, though, there are cases where the first they where they haven't amended, and the first they know about it is when they get a decision letter. None of these cases are of that character, are they? Yes, but what the tribunal would say to that, because when you look at the the case.
case law is that you, in a sense, knew about the discrepancy because this was your income. You had the income, you knew about it, and you made personal declarations. You said the um, Home Office... Well, it all depends what you mean by knew, but certainly you ought, to, you ought to have known. I think we can all accept that. A person ought to know now, when he's saying what his income was for a particular year, that he said something different a year or two previously. Um, I've got no problem with that. But in the context of these cases, you'll see because they're significant discrepancies, and you'll see in um, AB um, in particular, um, you'll see the judge says, well, this is a third of your income. You know, you've yeah, all right, uh, let, let's, let's, so, okay, let's get so to the heart of it. Of course, we'll assume they're, discrepant, they assume they're significant, we assume you ought to have known about it right. for the obvious reason I've just put. So, is okay. that enough? Well, the form itself makes clear that um, you have to give accurate information. Yeah, of and course, in yes. Order to be, like, entitled to IR. And that's the structure in which this is occurring. So already, and the form makes clear and gives you an opportunity to explain anything. If you want to, there's gaps on the form to explain before you declare at the bottom, this is all true and this is this is it. There's gaps on the form to explain everything. Okay. And an indication that, you you know, these are serious declarations. It's quite, you know, that you ought to be disclosing everything. And um, there's plenty of case law about disclosure of, of and the case law shows that, yes, because you're positively making an application and positively vouchsafing... Yeah. All right, but let's take the case where, where, where you have amended in the meantime. You say you're happy with the, um, with the figures. That presumably means with the amended figures. Um, uh, how does the questionnaire advance the argument? You, what, one thing you don't know is that someone is going to say that this, just the original figures you put in before you amended them were dishonestly put in. Because, the, because the, the, the figures you're relying upon in the immigration application, you say as applicant, are correct. They're the higher figures. In, in some of the cases. Yeah, the, in, the, in, the, yes, um, in some of the cases. And these are these cases. But at the end of the day, um, although in fact you'll see that quite a lot of the explanations don't actually marry up the figures, so that's another point. But assuming that what's happened here is, is the symmetry, that um, there was you know, a, a declaration made to HMRC of X, it's not correct. Um, the declaration to the Home Office is correct, and therefore when you've amended, you've actually achieved Yeah, correct. well, let's assume that. So, um, but it doesn't mean, and I, and I think this is the point my Lord's made, it doesn't mean that you were honest when you originally um, told HMRC the wrong figure. Doesn't mean, and well, that's, that's, it doesn't mean you're dishonest. Well, th this is where it comes with the, the sort of, I don't want to use prima facie case or reasonable grounds for, um, you know, yeah. assuming, but it's not assuming even, reasonable grounds for raising the question, raising, requiring an explanation. Yes. And it, that carries across my law, because if it's seen yeah, as reasonable... Sorry, no, but uh, no, time is short, we need to get to the yeah. point. A r in the typical case, an explanation is not required, and that's the problem. No, but my lord, what are my well, I mean, it is not asked for. Yeah, that's my the submission, what the general findings of the case law and in this context is, and it's a reasonable, is that it does cry out for an explanation. So you don't need the Secretary of State to put you on the spot and say, give me an explanation, give me, because of that opening part of it. Because in this constellation of factors, where you know you've had the income, you've put in the wrong figure, um, you've then been asked, is it all correct? And you've been asked to verify it. And, you know, you're given a chance to put an explanation in. And most of these well, cases are... Well, you're not asked to give an explanation. Uh, well, in, in the case where you've corrected the figures, the question is, are you, are you satisfied the figures which you are putting in are right? You're not asked to explain why you might have put in some different figures two years previously. But most people do explain, my Lord, and the reason for that in my submission is because it is reasonable to say that where you've given disparate figures, it calls for an explanation. And that carries for um, uh, this obligation that it, it isn't right, it's artificial to say you don't have to do anything, you don't have to respond in any way, although you've made all these declarations. Um, unless the Secretary of State asks you a direct question, um, were you honest or were you dishonest or, or things of that nature, that it's either inherent that there's something that's called for for explanation or there isn't. Um, uh, no. And that's on, it, on, it, on its facts. I, I, I haven't... Um, 
I'm confident I still haven't provided myself with a watch, yeah, but uh, last time I checked, yeah. it was nearly one o'clock, and it is presumably now one o'clock. Um, how, how much longer do you expect to be? Um, my Lord, really, um, it'd be very light touch um, on HMRC intervention, interaction and change side. So all I've really got to do is Article 8, which we've touched on. And, and to how much longer do you expect to be? So I would say um, probably, depending on um, questions, about 20 minutes. Right. Uh, Mr Malik. Yes. How much longer do you, or how long do you expect to be? Maybe that uh, I'm in a position to, to assist the court in relation to certain questions. Yes. That well, that will be questions. that that will be helpful. Well, I think it's going to be within. Um, my, my uh, I think we're, 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 it's a tight but achievable subject to uh, Ms. Knight wanting to make a substantial intervention. Um, well, I think we'll just have to see how we go. Yes. Um, but uh, if everyone can be as economical as they can. If we really get into difficulties, we may have to think about how to deal with the facts of some of the individual cases, but I think it's too early to grapple with that. Um, very well. Uh, uh, two o'clock.